So the question this evening is, of course, Kamala versus Trump. You know, as a political moderate myself, I actually view presidential elections as a referendum on the incumbent party. And we are in somewhat of a unique circumstance, given that Joe Biden has not really been leading anything, even though he wears the title of president, but instead his successor, his right hand man, who spent the last four years signing off on everything that they've done together, the fruits of their administration, is now on the campaign trail looking to succeed him in becoming America's next president. I don't know what she would like to be the president of, given that it has become abundantly clear throughout this administration under her watch that we don't even have a country anymore. If you remember the issue which launched Donald Trump's presidential campaign in 2015, it was the issue of immigration and sovereignty. America had been expressing anxiety about this issue since the 1990s. Nobody had offered them a political solution until Donald Trump descended from the golden escalator and did so. So he gets into office and we saw historic actions that worked at combating mass immigration, such as the Remain in Mexico policy, the ending of catch and release, $20 billion moving towards the border wall, actually allocating funds to build the border wall. He signed Title 42, which reduced immigration to near all-time lows during COVID. He implemented programs to standardize and professionalize deportation methods, which Obama in his final years sought to relax and destroy. Biden, on the other hand, when he gets into office, there are 302,000 encounters along the southwest border in December of 2023 alone, which is an all-time high. You see that being up from 31 or up 31 percent from November, up 13 percent from December of the prior year, uh, which was the previous all time high at that point. And yesterday we learned that 600,000 illegals are in this country now with uh, criminal records, including 14,000 who have been convicted of homicide, 15,000 who have been convicted of sexual assault. And the Biden-Harris administration have lost track of more than a quarter of a million migrant children, according to the DHS, uh, or the, excuse me, the Department of uh, Homeland Security's Inspector General. So Democrats took a look at this mess and they decided they would try to ram a bill through Congress written by two Democrats and one Republican. The GOP caucus outright rejected this bill because it would have allowed for a minimum of 15, or excuse me, 1.5 million asylum seekers and a maximum of 3 million. And it would write into law catch and release, among other things, that would weaken our southern border. So Republicans in the House, of course, rejected this bill and Democrats, of course, did this out of political desperation, and now they're claiming that Republicans killed this bipartisan bill uh, for political reasons. That's false. They, kill, they killed the bill because it's simply a bad bill. Joe Biden could fix immigration right now if he wanted to. He doesn't. On day one, rather, he actually restarted catch and release. He stopped the construction of 500 miles of Trump's border wall. He ended the Remain in Mexico policy, and he extended and granted TPS the stay of nearly 600,000 Haitians, which is a lot of fun. And he also signed an executive order on day one halting deportations. This is all inconducive to having a border which is sort of like Civilization 101. Who gets to be here? Who does not? Also, the economy, it's in the toilet. You had under Trump, 7 million new jobs, more than three times the government experts' projection. You had middle-class family income growing to nearly $6,000 more than what it had been prior, more than five times uh, the gains during the uh, previous administration. You had the unemployment rate that was reaching 3.5%, which was the lowest in a half century. You had an economy where now Americans, more than ever before, were reporting being employed, 160 million jobs, Jobless claims were at like a nearly 50 year low. You had more importantly, an economy where income was rising in every single metro area in the United States for the first time in three decades. Under Trump, we had 7 million people lifted off food stamps. Um, income inequality was falling for two straight years, which is the largest amount that it's been in over a decade. The bottom 50% of American households saw a 40% increase in net worth. Wages were rising for low income and blue collar workers, a 16% pay increase. And with Donald Trump confronting trade competitors around the globe, America was creating 1.2 million manufacturing and construction jobs. How did we get here? Was that by chance? Of course not. Donald Trump was removing 22 regulations for every one his administration was writing. The Republican Congress passed the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which put more money into businesses and into the pockets of consumers and the American people, which of course allowed for more economic growth. And we had Donald Trump as our president. He was the cheerleader for the economy and industry, and small business confidence was reaching historic highs, the highest they'd been since 1938, all under Donald Trump. At the end of the Obama administration, Non-residential equipment and structure investments were at near all-time lows. Um, following the passage of the Taxes and Jobs Cut Act, they were soaring to near uh, all-time highs. Under the leadership of Donald Trump, the economy was secure. Compare this with the Biden administration. You've got 20% inflation. Consumer confidence is in the toilet. Since the end, of the, pan, uh, the end of the pandemic, prime age working labor participation remains at historic lows, while a majority of jobs that have been created on net have all gone to immigrants. The job growth that Biden says he takes credit for, all the jobs that we've made in the 
recovery from COVID. On net, all of those are going to immigrants. None of those are going to Americans on net since 2019. And if you look at a survey from uh, Red Balloon and Public Square from 80,000 small businesses, they find that 40% of business owners have recently been forced to delay payments, 70% are putting staffing and expansion plans on hold, 64% believe that we're headed towards stagflation, and half say that definitely or probably they will not survive another four-year term under the Biden-Harris presidency. The Biden-Harris economy clearly is not working for the American taxpayer or for the American business owner. And of course, nothing matters if the economic growth that we have witnessed, to the extent that it even exists, does not go to the actual American people and does not actually work for them. As we'll discuss tonight, our economy under Kamala and Biden is one that works to fly illegal migrants into our country and one that works to spend money and sell weapons to other countries while American towns and American people are drowning under 10 feet of water. Joe Biden, yesterday, he said there's no more money for North Carolina, Tennessee, Georgia, all these people who desperately need support right now, but in the last two years, we have given $175 billion to Ukraine. Why? Literally why? The border wall, the most pro-American idea in the last 10 years, securing America's border. Civilization 101, that was supposed to cost like what, $10 billion, but that was too expensive. Trump's mass deportation plan is supposed to cost $100 billion. I have to read about why that's impossible every day in the New Yorker, but we're sending $175 billion to Ukraine just in the last two and a half years, um, which by the way is far more difficult mechanically, like laundering money to foreign countries, going through different organizations, keeping track of it. The point being, I pay taxes, you pay taxes. Wouldn't it be nice for a change to see that money actually going towards the interests of American people instead of to the citizens of the world? Wouldn't it be nice for the American government to actually look out for you and not everyone else in the world while you foot the bill? I won't hold my breath, however, expecting answers to these questions because they aren't supposed to be answered. They have no plan. They don't have a plan because they are completely beholden to the political establishment. That's why things can more or less continue operating and the public doesn't understand how badly their president's mental state is until the first time they wheel him out for a debate and people realize how gone this guy is because the White House can more or less continue to run because Joe Biden is not actually in charge and there's no plan but to continue the managed decline of our country. She even had no policies on her website until literally five minutes ago. And if she does have a plan to fix everything, you have to ask, okay, why? What's going wrong right now? You're in office. You've been in office for four years. Joe Biden clearly hasn't been in charge. So who has been in charge? Why don't you fix these things now? And I mean, he even owned up, Trump um, owned up to his record in 2020 by saying that he will continue to do more of what has been successful. If Kamala is saying, well, there are problems, how is that then not an indictment of her, everything that's happened in the last four years? And look at what's happening to day. We've got hurricanes destroying towns, destroying livelihoods, $30 billion in property damage, 160 people dead. What does Joe Biden say when asked if he has any words for the victims of the hurricane? He says, well, we've given them everything we have. They say, can we give any more resources? He says, no. Okay, so the commander in chief is missing. What about Kamala? She has this opportunity as his second in command to display and coordinate a field response, display leadership, use the power of the federal government in ways that she only and uniquely has access to, quelling any doubts that we may have about you know, her leadership capabilities, but she didn't. What she did instead is basically just take staged photographs on a plane um, instead of going to actually visit the people impacted by the hurricane, which is what Trump is doing. Trump is down there on the ground right now, distributing resources, telling people that the American people have not been forgotten about taking care of these things. Just like in the aftermath of the September 11th attacks, the deadliest in American history, Donald Trump was on the ground putting his guys to work, taking care of American people 15 years before he would even become president. And he's on the ground doing the same thing today. Kamala Harris is simply incapable of leading. She's not intelligent. She's not competent. She's not brave. She doesn't have the charisma. She's just the current face of the establishment. Everything that they do, you know, it's all talk. That's what Trump talked about. All talk, no action. She is just the incumbent role of that. She has no agency herself. She will simply continue what has been going on for the last 60 years in this country. And they will never forgive Donald Trump for convincing the American people that it didn't have to be that way. That it doesn't have to just be this managed decline where everything is more expensive yet less in quality and you're now working and, and can't afford to go to school and, and let alone uh, graduate and find a job and because they're all on net going to immigrants, they will never forgive Trump for challenging these political orthodoxies, let alone successfully. And so it's really not so much a question about Trump versus Kamala. It seems to be much more Trump versus whatever has been happening in our country for the last 60 years. And Trump is the only successful candidate of any of these political orth um, orthodoxies to be able to break free from them. And Kamala is just the incumbent candidate uh, with the blessing and backing of the entire political establishment. So if you want things to continue how they've been going for the last four years and broadly speaking the last 60 years, then you can support Kamala. But if you actually want to create opportunities that will meaningfully change our country and make it great again, then the obvious choice is Donald J. Trump for president. Thank you.
Thank you very much for that opening, John. We're going to kick it over to Stephen for 10 minutes as well. And just want to let everybody know that if Stephen would like, he can push some of his opening statement time into the open dialogue if he doesn't want to take the full 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Stephen, for being with us. The floor is all yours for your opening as well. Real quick, James, can you guys hear me? I'm audible? Yes. OK, cool. All right, let me throw my timer on screen. <laughs> Okay, I'm good. Ready? Yeah. Clear. Yes, Perfect. I think I heard a yes there. Yes. Okay. We have two parties in the United States, and right now, one of those parties lives in delusion. Um, conservatives rely on the ability to cast a huge net and to cover a ton of ground and to lie and lie and lie about every single topic they bring up. That's why if you try to ever actually force a conservative to own a particular position, they will pivot away from that and go to some other position where they will lie. Okay, Most of the people that, for instance, I'm debating on these types of debates now don't believe, for instance, that dinosaurs existed. Um, if you look at things like, uh, I believe, the uh, response to the recent disasters was brought up in North Carolina, if you look at the responses from DeSantis, if you look at the response responses uh, from Kemp in Georgia, if you look at the response from uh, Collins, the, everybody is saying we are getting exactly what we need. Joe Biden has called these people already. It is a lie that Donald Trump is pushing. It is a lie that conservatives like John Dorley are pushing, that states aren't getting what they need from Biden. This is just not true. Google.com, search for it. Governor's response, recent disaster. Governor's response, hurricane. It's not true. Everything he says is a lie. Now, on the contrary, there has been Donald Trump who has refused aid to states before. There are reported conversations with Kushner saying that Donald Trump wanted to withhold aid from people. Initially in California, when the wildfires were happening under his term, Donald Trump withheld that aid. In a speech a few days ago, Donald Trump talked again about potentially withholding aid from California if they didn't sign on to a bill uh, that would open up more land in the North for agricultural purposes. There is only one president that I know of in recent history that has threatened to withhold national federal aid from states in times of disaster, and that is Donald Trump. Joe Biden has never done this. You will not find statements of him ever doing this. You can look at, I believe, Roy Collins on Twitter right now, uh, just yesterday tweeted a thanks to Biden for calling him and providing everything that they need. This is a lie, like basically every other thing that is said in support of the Republicans. And even ignoring all of the policy, we can even say, fine, uh, maybe they might have a better stance on uh, the border. Uh, they don't. Maybe they might have a better stance on the economy. They don't. Uh, maybe they might have a better stance on foreign policy. They definitely don't. Fine, maybe they do, but even if they did, Donald Trump wouldn't be the guy that would be able to get anything done. Donald Trump was not able to get funding for the wall. He wasn't able to build the wall. He ruled like a dictator with executive order. I think he built uh, an itty bitty fence and then he walked away with his tail between his legs and he called that a victory. So if you did want a wall, if immigration was something that was scary to you, why would you rely on Donald Trump, who was a massive and total and utter failure in his administration, where both sides of Congress were controlled by his party to do anything? Why He wouldn't be the guy for it. He was incapable of doing it. And he was only able to have such good numbers because he was able to rely on COVID to shut down the border with Title 42. And he was able to rely on the fact that a lot of people were sick and didn't feel like making the journey to the United States. And you can tell because if you look at that graph that he lies about, that he shows at events where he says, this is when I left office, he actually left office like uh, about a year later when the uh, immigration numbers are starting to spike up again. So if immigration is your issue, Donald Trump's not the guy to solve it. He can't work with Congress to pass legislation. There was a big bill on the border from Lankford that Doyle for some reason called a Democrat authored. Uh, this bill had widespread support among Republicans until Donald Trump came and shut it down. Interviews with Lankford confirmed this. You can watch a speech with Ted Cruz where he says this. You can watch McConnell talking about it in the Senate where he confirms this. Nobody is debating this seriously except for the people, the sycophants that try to carry water for Trump outside of his administration. I say outside of his administration because nobody from his last administration is left. Uh, how do you have all these people? You, know, you, you look at the people that he surrounded himself with. Where are they at? Donald Trump won in 2016 running on a ticket with Vice President Mike Pence or ex-Vice President Mike Pence. Where is Pence? Why isn't he running anymore? Oh, because when he was in office last, Donald Trump basically watched and tried to get him killed <laughs> when he was at the uh, when he was in uh, at the Capitol building trying to certify the election. Donald Trump sat by and he watched for three hours. You want to talk about a dereliction of duty or an absent commander in chief? He sat by and he watched while the Capitol was rioted, while it was taken over for three hours, doing absolutely nothing in the attempts to maybe win the election uh, because the people would be too scared to certify it after he riled his crowd up and he sent them out of the Capitol.
If you look at Donald Trump's approach to foreign policy, it was a joke. People say there were no wars under Donald Trump. What do you mean? No, what, what, what does that even mean? We were, we were in a conflict all over the world. He was still doing drone strikes in Yemen. We did the assassination of Soleimani. Uh, we had troops that were active in Syria. We had a military presence that was still in Afghanistan. There was still a Russian occupation of Crimea. We, we, there was a, an Iranian attack on Saudi Arabia. There were riots in the Gaza Strip. Like When we say there, was, there were no wars in, in, in the rest of the world, this is just another conservative delusion. And what are the what are the foreign policy positions that Donald Trump has? And don't just not the empty platitudes, okay? Not Donald Trump where he stands and he leans forward like a fucking giraffe because you don't want people to see that he weighs 350 pounds, okay? Give me an actual policy position that Donald Trump has or has at least espoused when it comes to dealing with oh, oh, you we actually we can't do that. Because every single time on every single interview where Donald Trump is asked about his foreign policy, he says, I can't spoil it, it's a secret. Well, it's not a secret. We watched what happened when he was in office. When he sent uh, Tillerson and Pence over to North Korea, uh, later on, Trump tweeted out, Tillerson, don't waste your time. Okay, I think, I think Pence actually said it was a waste of time. I believe that was reported behind the scenes. Nobody thought that anything could happen in North Korea. They were back to testing their missiles a month later. Nothing happened there, except for the fact that Kim got a photo with Donald Trump, and Donald Trump, for the first time in U.S. history, was the commander-in-chief of the U.S. Armed Forces saluting an enemy's military. For who the knows what reason uh let's see did he have a good success in uh, any good success in syria well let's see he completely and utterly ditched our allies uh the kurdish fighters that were fighting alongside the fsa against bashar al-assad somebody who engaged in chemical warfare against his own citizens enough that trump saw fit to bomb an airport was that also another action that wasn't a war or wasn't part of military conflict i don't know it's hard to keep track of what conservatives consider what uh because it seems like they got a double standard for literally everything and when i say double standard i mean an actual human standard for democrats and actually no standard for republicans Republicans. Um, when we look at things like the economy, we talked about polling kids out of, out of childhood poverty. Did Donald Trump have a policy for that? Well, let's see. When he was in front of that economic forum and they asked him, Donald Trump, what one specific policy would you actually give uh, in order to alleviate childhood po poverty? He, he gave an answer that puts Biden at his worst moments to shame. This was one of the most unbelievable word salads I've ever heard in my entire life. I thought the man was either about to have a stroke or was halfway through one by the time he finished his his, his answer to that question. Um, but again, Republicans have absolutely no standards. They do not live in reality. They think that oil is a self-replenishing thing that comes to the ground because dinosaurs weren't real. Half of them think the Earth is 6,000 years old. We had all these predictions about COVID and the mRNA vaccines and the Chinese-made virus in the lab that didn't come true. Nothing that conservatives have said has come true uh, in terms of all the fear-mongering they did. Nothing. We, we had four years of Biden. Where's my communism? Where was the destruction of the country? It's not here. We've got Donald Trump who wants to come into the uh, next administration to do what? Put 10 or 20 percent tariffs on everything? What, is he going to go back on the U.S., Mexico, Canada, uh, the North America Free Trade Agreement, the one that he was so proud of that superseded NAFTA? Is he going to destroy that so that he can tariff everything? Or is he just speaking empty platitudes? Or, more likely, does Donald Trump not even really know what a tariff is? Does Donald Trump know the difference between a trade deficit and a budget deficit and, a, and our national debt? Uh, you might want to, you know, defend him and say, well, I'm sure he does know the difference. But then if that's the case, why is it that in the four years of Donald Trump, where our economy was doing so well, why the f*** were we running record deficits before COVID? Why was this happening? If, if Donald Trump and the Republicans are so good about tackling our debt and doing something about the deficit, why was he still running record deficits while the economy was exploding 20, 25% year over year over year? Why was Donald Trump trying to use Twitter to bully Powell, to bully the Federal Reserve, to keep interest rates low? I, why was Donald Trump sending his Department of Justice into the states to try to fabricate election results? Why was Donald Trump trying to bully Jeff Sessions or Comey or Christopher Wray to kill investigations related to him or people around him uh, when people in his close company, like Roger Stone, were directly communicating with foreign adversaries in order to leak information about, our, um, about the Democrats? Donald Trump is easily one of the worst presidents of all time, and his character uh, should reflect on, on the people that defend him as well. Because remember, the only way to defend Donald Trump is to ignore reality, to be delusional, to pretend that everything under his administration didn't happen, to, pre to pretend that things under Biden have happened that haven't happened, and, and, and to pretend that somehow in the future he's going to be able to do all of these things that he ha had a monumental failure of attempting during his four years. And remember, it's going to be with an entirely new administration because nobody that works with Trump ever wants to 
work with him again because either they see that Trump is corrupt or he calls them a rhino. Um, and and so now we have a, a, a new Trump. We've got a new vice president with Trump, a guy that said he would co-sign onto all of the malicious activity that Trump wants to do, which Pence wasn't willing to go along with. Um, you know, God knows who he'd want to staff the Department of Justice with or what any of his other cabinet positions would be like. And God help us all. Uh, you know, even if Trump loses the election, honestly, even if he loses the election by a landslide, the fact that there are so many tens of millions of Americans that have been lied to and, and tricked and deceived by the figures that were supposed to be at the left. Remember when we were supposed to have a George Soros controlling all of our communications and instead we got an Elon Musk who is full-throatedly, avowedly, you know, pro-Trump and, and posting AI misinformation about Kamala Harris, uh, you, you know, on a social media platform. Remember when the Hunter Biden laptop suppression was like the worst thing that's ever happened to the world? And then we get a J.D. Vance leak and all of a sudden now Republicans believe in foreign interference. Now people leaking stuff about actual politicians, believe it or not, Hunter Biden never ran for anything. I don't know if people remember that. Now it's a huge problem. Censoring stories was supposed to be the worst thing. We, we care about docs. We care about all these things now. It's crazy how Republicans discover morality and standards whenever they have to levy any type of criticism to the left. I just wish that at some point they would live up to a single standard or apply anything consistently across the board. Thank you very much for that 10 minute opening statement as well. Stephen, we are going to switch it back to John for his five minute rebuttal. John, thanks very much. The floor is all yours. It seemed to me like there was a lot there that was generally just firing from the hip at Republicans and specifically Donald Trump. And I think what it gets down to, which is what this debate often does, is just competing views of how politics actually works in this country. Destiny seems to be somebody who has faith in the establishment and the system, generally speaking, to do its job. And uh, Donald Trump's political project is exactly the opposite of that. Donald Trump's political project was to go in and drain the swamp. And as anybody who's a Trump supporter knows, and maybe even laments, that did not exactly happen in his first administration. And it's because Donald Trump was the first president uh, under the Republican ticket who was not awarded a mechanically functioning administration. Donald Trump, even George Bush, who I don't think anyone here maybe is a fan of the way that his administration functioned, but that administration functioned as it should have in the sense that George Bush was able to delegate and get things done. Donald Trump was not able to do this because there were so many people who understood that he was simply an irritant to an otherwise functioning, well-oiled machine, which is the Washington establishment. They didn't necessarily want to, uh, to hitch their cart to that and taint a resume or you had Reince Priebus, the former head of the RNC. You know, he had a Rolodex of names ready to go to fill these staffing positions. So it's not at all surprising to me that Trump was not able to execute the way that other presidents, including Republican presidents, were able to execute because everything that Trump sought to do was a disruption of orthodoxies which have existed for 60 years and would like to exist after Donald Trump. And I think that a lot of those uh, personnel issues have been resolved since. I think he understands some of the problems there. Um, but I also think it's sort of nonsensical to uh, conflate, you know, sort of Republican delusion with Democrat delusion. Because when you have Republican delusion, that's like your aunt or uncle at dinner who says something like, um, I don't know, what if elites are like satanic and do crazy rituals? And it's like, yeah, that's crazy. Democrat delusion is like what these people run on. They run on the issue of, hey, what if we put an axe wound in between a child's legs? Wouldn't that be neat? Hey, what if we couldn't actually define like what a woman is? Things like that. Again, very low hanging fruit, but simultaneously, I think very important to understand exactly which party is the one advertising and establishing power based on delusion. Um, and so I didn't really hear much that was addressing the points I laid out directly in terms of why Trump did X. It was successful. Biden undid X. And now we are experiencing uh, bad results because of that. And so um, in terms of Trump's staffing issues, again, you have an incentive there to not want to hitch your card to that. Whereas Kamala Harris had the highest overturning rate for her White House staff in history. It was like 92 percent. 92 percent of people who were working for her went away. They said, no, thank you. No more. What kind of leader is it where people who are the closest to her, working for her, in proximity to her, with no other incentive, no other obvious lily pad? I mean, you're working for Kamala Harris. That's maybe the future president. That's the vice president. They still left those jobs because working for her was such a nightmare. So the idea that she could somehow command and be a better executive than Donald Trump is just completely nonsense. Moreover, we haven't even heard that case. All we've heard is that Donald Trump is bad because Republicans are delusional or things like that. Um, the tariff policy, I don't understand why we're against tariffs. Tariffs are like as American as apple pie. Every man who's on Mount Rushmore was a protectionist. 95% of all imports during the, the, the height of America's economic growth in the 19th and 20th century um, were tariffed. Um, Biden even kept the tariffs that Trump implemented. So if they were so bad with the Chinese imports, I mean, you, you would think that he would have repealed those, but of course he didn't. He held on to them. So 
I think that, uh, yeah, you know, the president is the executive. He doesn't have to necessarily pass bipartisan legislation to be an effective president. He is the executive, the chief executive. You know, uh, Sam Francis once said that there are two parties in D.C. You have an evil party and a retarded party. And occasionally, those two parties get together and do something evil and retarded, and we call that bipartisanship. I think that's actually true. I don't think bipartisan legislation is an accurate measure for what makes a good leader. A Congress has, what, a 2% approval rating on its best day, something like that? We think working with these people, these swamp rats, is actually indicative of what makes a good leader. A good leader is someone who can get in there and just pass his legislation through. We'll figure out the legal, I shouldn't say it. We'll pass his legislation and you know, it gets held up in the courts as it often did with Trump, for example, when he was trying to work through the executive branch and get these different things done. Again, he passed what? The tax cut. Why? Because even though we maybe agree with tax cuts, ultimately the people who are in charge don't really have a problem with tax cuts. So you have deficit spending, like he said, when the government's taking in less revenue. I don't know what that deficit was precisely precisely, but I bet that it was bigger than the amount that the wall would have cost. Why can't we have a wall? Why can't we have mass deportation? Because immigration is what benefits the ruling class because we have more people coming in from other countries. They are reliant upon the establishment for money, opportunities, etc., which are then taken away from American citizens, as we've seen with the job growth, as we see with money that's going for relief, all sorts of different things. The Haitians, I don't know why, you know, I was driving through Ohio to get here. I, I never thought I'd see a Haitian in Ohio. Nothing against Haitians, it's just, you know, peas and apples and oranges, I guess. I don't know. But that should not be happening. We should not be prioritizing the interests of other people from all over the world like we have been during this administration. And Donald Trump dared to say that we can actually put America first. And that is why they have done everything in their power, be it lawsuits to assassination attempts, which my opponent this evening makes jokes about and thinks they're actually warranted, to stop this man because he upsets those orthodoxies in a way that no one else dared to. Thank you very much for that five minute rebuttal. We'll switch back to Stephen for his five minute rebuttal. Stephen, the floor is yours. Can you tell me when I'm getting on time, okay? Because I can't, I don't have a timer in front of me, okay? Will do. Okay, all right, or give me, give me a 30 second notice, okay. Okay, well, Donald Trump talks about draining the swamp. I'm sorry, Donald Trump is the swamp. The, the most effective swamp that Donald Trump trained, uh, drained were his own cabinet members. When every single person around a guy, whether be it his personal people like Cohen, be it his own cabinet members uh, like uh, Rex Tillerson, uh, people like Mike Pence, uh, be it his own family members or his wife like Melania, who doesn't want to even be seen with him, uh, whether it's other people in office who are begging him to call off the rioters on January 6th, like when him and McCarthy got into a fight on the phone. Uh, every single person that has worked with Trump says that he is trash, and he is trash. How can you scream about having Jabba the Hutt draining the swamp when he is the swamp? Everywhere he goes is a swamp. If Donald Trump hadn't done The Apprentice, he would be a brokey crackhead wandering the streets of the Bronx or Manhattan trying to get a hit. He is a loser in every single part of his life. And the party backing him right now are losers. And I don't mean that in the abstract sense of let's have another five-hour conversation about trans issues, but I mean that in the sense that his personal business adventures have been an epic failure. He's filed bankruptcy uh, almost over half a dozen times, I believe. Uh, people from his prior administration have abandoned him. His own family is abandoning him. He is a convicted felon for a good reason, too. He's facing more felony charges. All of the lawyers that were working with him before have been either criminally indicted, criminally convicted, or in the case of people like Powell or Giuliani, disbarred, meaning they can't even practice law again, or, uh, or Eastman as well. Um, so the idea that we need to drain the swamp, Trump is the swamp, and he surrounds himself with the swamp. I've never seen people so gleefully line up to, to celebrate when a guy says, I fired the bad people, ignoring the fact that he hired the bad people too. You can't com complain and cry uh, about your own administration when it's your administration. And if you want to, that's fine, you could do that, but it just goes to further prove my point. Donald Trump is not the guy for the job. Even if you hate Kamala Harris, even if you think that Donald Trump's policies are good, he's clearly an ineffective leader, and I'm not willing to sit by for another four years while this guy takes another run at the office to see if maybe he can figure out how the f to do his job this time because he clearly was incapable of doing it last time. The Republicans, for the first time in the history of the United States Congress, weren't even able to keep their majority speaker seat because there was so much infighting in the party. It's absolutely insane that we could look at a party like this and think that they're capable of governing. That you, you have a president that, that is trying to aggressively witch hunt into the ground all these people. You, uh, you want to bring up concrete facts. Again, look at Roy Collins' response in North Carolina today compared to under Trump's administration when they put in a request for some 800, uh, I think it was what, $800 million, and they got like 
like eight. They got 1% of the requested aid. You could Google this. North Carolina, 2017, uh, requested financial aid, requested federal aid. You could find this. This is all real. They're all facts. There's no way to hide from them. You know what else is facts? You want to talk about draining the swamp? Why do you have pardon lists that people like Giuliani and Eastman are referring to when they're working for Donald Trump? Why are these people going into office assuming they're going to be breaking crimes, asking to be put on a pardon list afterwards? Why is Donald Trump pardoning people like Manafort, who's proven to work uh, in Ukraine, you know, the thing and, and, and taking money without declaring it, the things that the Republicans so desperately have been trying to accuse Hunter Biden of doing for years? Why is Donald Trump pardoning people like Blackwater contractors who are responsible for massacres in the country of Iraq? I thought we didn't like foreign intervention. I thought we didn't like this type of like foreign policy, I guess, unless Donald Trump is saying things like we're going to kill the terrorist families or we're going to take all of the Syrian oil fields. Um, I wish the Republican delusion was just about dinosaurs or oil, but unfortunately, the Republican delusion runs far deeper and is far sicker. Uh, you heard Doyle laugh and joke and say, well, you know, uh, you got to pass legislation and figure out the legality afterwards. He's joking, but that's not a joke. That was the plan on January 6th. That's why Eastman said, we're going to try this particular thing, but if it gets tested to the courts, we'll probably lose 2-7. Eh, no, we'll probably lose 0-9. We'll probably lose every single Supreme Court justice. But you know what? I bet it won't even make it to court because it's a major political question. We're not even going to touch it. And that was the whole plan to overthrow the election. They still, 80% of Republicans still to this day don't even believe that the results of the last election were real. Um, so unfortunately, the delusion goes much further. You want to talk about uh, what is a woman? Well, right now, according to a conservative, a woman could be a fucking fugitive of her state. State if she is crossing state lines because she might be going after an abortion. Uh, a, a woman might be somebody who you can track at the border if she wants to drive into another state that has legalized access to certain types of contraceptions or certain types of abortion procedures because you don't want her to be able to have an abortion. 30 seconds. Uh, I, I mean, the, the idea that Republican delusion, yeah, doesn't run as deep as it does and isn't deeply rotting, not only in a character and moral sense, but also just in a procedural sense, uh, it is laughable. Uh, again, you want to talk about like uh, Donald Trump, uh, you know, and the fact that tariffs are great. I don't know where that 95% number came from, uh, but Donald Trump's big crowning achievements were tax cuts, which was deficit spending, and renegotiating the NAFTA agreement into the US uh, Mexico Canada Free Trade Agreement, now which he wants to completely destroy with tariffs. So even a little bit that he did accomplish was either just deficit is spending like they accuse Democrats of doing or something that he wants to blow up as soon as he gets into office anyway. Time. Thank you very much, Stephen. We'll now move into the prepared questions. So I have one for each of you. We'll start with John. This is one that I think was uh, briefly alluded to, but I want to give you a chance to both talk on this. As I mentioned earlier, John will have five minutes to respond and then Destiny will have a three minute rebuttal to that response. For John, in the late May hush money trial this year in which Donald Trump was convicted of 34 felony counts. The prosecutor in the case said it was, quote, a planned, coordinated, long-running conspiracy by Donald Trump to influence the 2016 election by paying off those who reported his bad behavior, unquote. Do you agree with the prosecutor that this election, uh, that this was election interference, and should this, namely Trump's 34 felony counts, be a relevant factor for citizens deciding who they'll vote for this November? Uh, I think it was a witch hunt. I don't think it's a relevant factor, and I don't think anyone actually thinks it's a relevant factor. I mean, his approval rating, his polling didn't significantly drop. You are simply firing at the hip, and you plug in convicted felon when you are attacking Donald Trump. But if it weren't convicted felon, then it would be, well, he was charged as a, it would be whatever it has to be to simply paint Orange Man as bad. Just like it's, I mean, in 2016, it was the, the Russia collusion, uh, and, and we've had things ever since then. We've had multiple impeachments. Just painting this guy as like an absolute threat to democracy, literally Hitler, but then he gets in office and things are more or less like okay, actually. It's not the end of the world. His supposed delusion does not seem to be manifesting into the way that the country is and the way that, you know, the, the Biden administration or the Harris administration, which seems to be operating, I guess, on not delusional ideas, is actually manifesting in lower qualities of life for everybody who's in this country. I mean, real house net worth is down, incomes are down, crime is up, unemployment. I mean, people are not happy with the way things are going. If Trump is so delusional and crazy, why is it that he had high approval ratings at this point in his administration uh, than does Biden or Kamala. I mean, Kamala had the lowest approval rating for any vice president before the incentive was given to be a cheerleader for her because she became the nominee um, after you know Biden had to step down and everything. So yeah, I absolutely believe that uh, it was fake, and I think that voters are and should be disregarding it because the question is ultimately not about these sort of trivialities. It's about who is going to actually create a better life for Americans. I think I laid out very clearly in my opening statement that Donald Trump can do that, has done that, and will once again do 
do that. And I'm having to sort of deal with these things about Trump firing neocons and I'm supposed to be really upset that that happened. Like, yeah, I mean, if you're going to build a foreign policy establishment and you want to posture as being strong, I'm gonna hire the guy who wants to like make, I don't know, the entire Middle East into a parking lot. Cause I want them to know it's there, I might do it. And then when you know we have problems, maybe we fire him or things like that. Like that computes to me, that makes sense to me. That is what I would do in that situation as a loyal MAGA patriot. I don't think that's necessarily delusional or anything like that. So yeah, I mean, again, Trump's political project was something that was ambitious. It was this idea that we are going to break free from party orthodoxies on immigration, which in the 2000s, you would get fired from mainstream conservative establishments for even hinting at expressing attitudes, which now Trump are now, Trump is now endorsing and making a, the, uh, the baby boomers at the RNC hold up signs in support of mass deportations. Uh, things like trade policy, which again, you could not question. Things like foreign policy. I mean, your measure of republicanism up until Donald Trump was your expressed support for the wars in particularly Iraq, but broadly speaking, the Middle East. How Republican you are was defined by that. And then Donald Trump gets on stage with Jeb Bush and says, actually, uh, the towers came down under your brother. We weren't safe. Um, it was a big fat mistake. And he was booed. People forget that. He was booed by every Everybody in the audience, all the donors, all the special interests, and so this guy's not a leader, yet in the last 10 years he has wrestled control of the party and made it his own. I don't care if the swamp has a problem with that and there are hurdles, obviously, we're trying to drain the swamp. Do you think these people are going to go kicking and screaming? I mean, they're theater kids. What else would they do if not work in D.C. as complete losers and sycophants? So yeah, that doesn't come as a surprise to me at all that there are going to be these problems. But remember in 2020, he's out of office, you've got primary campaigns coming from DeSantis, people are blaming him for the disappointing midterm results, all these things. He manages to still wrestle control of his party to where now his transition team, the people in charge of filling his next administration, are loyalists. They are his family as opposed to the neocons and swamp rats they were. He's learned his lesson. This guy has managed to wrestle control of the Republican Party and make it more into his own. The entire RNC is Donald Trump Lollapalooza. I mean, this guy is the leader of the Republican Party, which is why when I drive here through the heartland of the country, I see Trump flags and Trump bumper stickers because people understand that what Donald Trump means is a rejection of whatever the establishment orthodoxy is. It is a political identity that says, no, thank you. I don't like what's going on. And that is why people love him. That is why people take bullets for him. And that is why people will stand out in the cold rain to see this guy speak whenever he goes. Kamala doesn't draw crowds like that. Obama could but no other uh, Democrat politician can even come close because there's no energy, because people don't actually believe that these people have a vision for the country. They simply don't like Trump, which is why Destiny has not outlined a vision for the country. He simply does not like Trump. He is the same. I'm here tonight with you, the people, like Trump was. Destiny, like Kamala, his candidate, they are alike in this way, are coming in remotely. It is one to one. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Stephen, you have three minutes to respond to John. The floor is all yours. Yeah, I want to point out a phrase that was used that is incredibly important to understand for people that are sycophantically aligned with Donald Trump, and that was the phrase loyal MAGA patriot. These people's allegiance is to Donald Trump before country. These people's allegiance is with the idea of Donald Trump and the epic name calling before anything that was outlined in the Constitution, like our founding fathers said, or anything having to do with the way that our government runs. That's why MAGA patriots, like Biden so wisely said years ago in that horrific speech that he gave that conservatives love to obsess over with the red background that MAGA Republicans are a threat to this country. And they are. They are exactly the type of illiberal uh, establishment disrespecting uh, absolutely no appreciation for process or rule of law people that represent one of the largest threats to this country. When you talk about every single thing that has to do with Donald Trump and all the good things, there are all these empty, worthless platitudes. Where's the legislation? There's none. If Donald Trump couldn't get legislation passed besides tax cuts with both halves of Congress, why would I ever expect him to get anything done the next time when he doesn't have both halves of Congress? And, and screw it, what does even having both halves of Congress mean? I, I should say all three halves of Congress, because in the House, the Republicans couldn't even keep their own party together. So the idea that Donald Trump is going to be some effective leader is absolutely ludicrous. And the record shows that. The record demonstrates that. You want to look at legislation under Biden, who's supposed to be an old, decrepit, and senile man, then why is it that when Donald Trump talks about China, Joe Biden signs the CHIPS Act. 
Why is it that when Donald Trump talks about deficit spending and cutting and, and cutting costs of government, Biden gets the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, Act passed that actually offsets government spending uh, by raising money? Why is it that when Donald Trump makes all of these empty promises, all we can do is blame every single person around them, uh, around him? Meanwhile, Biden says that he's a leader for all of America and he will lead uh, all of America. And then coming up, I would expect Kamala Harris to do the exact same. If you want to talk about why nobody's talking about policies, or you want to make fun of the fact that Kamala Harris didn't have policies on a website for long enough, Donald Trump and the Republicans don't talk about policies. We how 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 many minutes did we make it into this debate before trans issues were brought up by the MAGA patriot on stage? Uh, and again, consult the record. You want to talk about empty witch hunts, and then you bring up RussiaGate, which has turned out dozens of credible Russian indictments, which initially, uh, I guess my friend on the stage didn't want to believe in, but now as we've gotten more indictments, we see that the Russian infiltration into our news cycle is way more extreme than any conservative is willing to admit, as we saw with the recent indictments and the statement by the FBI about the 600 or so other influencers, maybe the guy up on stage, who knows, that are also being paid off by foreign uh, adversaries. 30 seconds. We're talking about empty witch hunts. What, uh, what about the fact that the, the Bill Clinton, Monica Lewinsky thing came after four years of Ken Starr investigations into completely unrelated matters? Uh, what about the Hillary Clinton Benghazi email scandal, which turned out exactly zero credible indictments? Uh, what about the Biden impeachment thing that was just moved through the House from Jim Jordan that didn't even recommend impeachment at the end because they couldn't literally find anything? What about the fact that Hunter Biden has been charged with uh, ta with, with federal crimes of tax fraud and, and, and lying on a 4473 because he was caught smoking drugs in a video? Meanwhile, Roger Stone, who had over $2 million to the IRS is, is just filing a, a civil agreement, a settlement, and just paying it off. Time. Every single thing that the Republicans say is, is, a, is a projection of their own bad behavior on the other side. Time. Never specific, never a policy, Steven. never a piece of legislation. Always a lie. All right. We now have a prepared question for Stephen. He'll get five minutes to respond, and then John, likewise, will get three minutes to respond to what Stephen said. Stephen, aside from no taxes on tips, how can Kamala help mitigate the current heavy cost of living for so many Americans trying to make rent or mortgage payments? In other words, are there any sort of blanket policies that might help those who don't make tips? Uh, for me personally, I, I don't know if the tip thing is ever going to pass. For me personally, I think that expanding zoning is probably one of the most important things. Uh, I know that Kamala has talked about giving a large credit to first-time home buyers, uh, which would obviously help people that haven't purchased a home before and people that aren't in real estate investing purchase a home. And I know that they've also talked about expanding things or making permanent, rather, the child tax credit for families and people, especially with children, are some of the people that need homes the most. So ideally, that sort of federal redistribution of wealth to poorer families, especially those with young children that need larger homes are going to be able to utilize that money in order to buy more homes. Um, these are policies that I would expect would help a little bit. But I mean, on the aggregate, housing policy is something that really needs to be dealt with at the local level. And federal subsidies or federal money back to uh, poor people can probably only do so much. I think that it's probably more important to focus on things that increase the overall health of our economy, like inviting high skilled uh, or immigrants of low skill that are willing to work into this economy rather than shutting them out, uh, increasing trade so that knowledge, information, patent, um, our, our ability to export products uh, continues to grow and increase, which which grows and fosters a bigger demand for U.S. labor and U.S. technology, rather than what people like Trump and Doyle want to do, which is tariff everything, lock yourselves up and shut the world down. I think having a strong foreign policy where we can protect tradeways like the Suez Canal, like Biden did to the Yemens, uh, uh, to the well, to the Houthis more explicitly, is important rather than running away from the world stage and giving it all over to uh, Russia and China and hoping that they look out for our, our uh, good. And I, I think that having a friendlier disposition towards the world where you're willing to, uh, you know, help your allies and be a strong leader and foster good relationships that allow for trade, uh, for education uh, and for people to, you know, really travel from one place to another, I think all would help the economy in a larger way that would help people be able to afford homes. In addition to the explicit federal policies that they set out relating to uh, tax policy. Even thank you very much. We'll kick it over to John for his three minute rebuttal. Um, I would just say that in the phrase loyal MAGA patriot, you must understand that contained within that you have the phrase MAGA, which of course the A in MAGA stands for America. So I am a loyal American patriot and I'm also a loyal MAGA patriot. And the difference specifically in this political context is that MAGA means make America great again, which implies that we used to be a great country and now we're not so great, but we can restore that. That is something that we just have a fundamental disagreement on. Destiny seems to think that everything is going very well. And if it's maybe not, 
it's not because the political establishment has some sort of interest to harm the citizens of this country. It's just because we haven't exactly tweaked the policy in the way that it needs to be written. And so maybe if we just hire the right staff or something, that can be different. Um, in terms of the uh, president not getting policy done, again, like I, I disbelieve that the Congress will actually pass legislation. I mean, famously, for example, Republicans can get tax cuts passed. Great. Uh, Democrats can get infrastructure bills uh, passed. Great. These are not things that really, when it comes down to it, change the way our system works. I mean, you have money either being put back into our pockets or money being uh, redirected into, I don't know, to stimulate the economy because they tend to like the demand side of the curve a little bit more. The president is the chief executive. Donald Trump can get in there and he can still legislate through the executive branch and get things done because his job is to enforce laws. The laws are on the books. Joe Biden's administration is giving orders to those bureaucracies to not enforce those laws, to literally remove barricades from the southern border that were otherwise there so that migrants can come into the country illegally. And again, he ended on day one catch and release. These people are just in the country. They're criminals. They're other, I mean, some I assume are good people. But the point is, we don't know who these people are and our government should be accountable to the American people. I mean, even as someone who's pro-democracy, I should think that you should appreciate that more so than this idea that we're somehow reliant on immigrants, let alone for, for labor or something. I believe in American exceptionalism. I don't think that we need anybody else in the world to show America how to build a society. I think that the West, broadly speaking, built the modern world. I think we have plenty of people here. I don't think that we need these people coming over from other countries um, to take jobs that would otherwise go to Americans, especially when American college graduates can't get jobs. They're sitting through multiple interviews if they're even lucky to get interviews. They, they're not able to work in the fields that they go into to college for. And so I don't think it's uh, very patriotic to then take those jobs and offer them up to whoever wants to come over here from China or India or wherever. Thank you very much. We are going to jump into the open dialogue. This is 10 minutes. Gentlemen, thank you very much. I'll let you take it from here. You know, you mentioned the CHIPS Act as an example uh, of successful Biden legislation. Isn't it accurate that since, I think since August of 2024, none of that has actually come to fruition. They've had delays with plant man, uh, manufacturing in, um, in Arizona. Nothing's gone on in Ohio. South Korea, I suppose, is delaying the construction in the Arizona factory. I mean, how could you say that the policy is effective because we got it through Congress, but it's not actually coming to fruition yet? And it's been, what, 2022 that was passed or something? What do you think it means for something to come to fruition? Uh, I think it means you'd start to see construction in the factories. You'd start to see chips being distributed. So, so you're telling me you don't think any large companies have allocated money towards factories? You, the fact that you're saying things are getting delayed already betrays the premise that you're saying that nothing has been done. The fact that there is a delay means that the process is already working. The money has already been allocated from the federal budget, meaning there are already companies that are setting up shop to take advantage of it, meaning that it's already working its way through the system in order to get those plants built. I don't know why you would say, you see how there's a delay here? Doesn't that mean nothing there is going are. on? Well, no. If nothing is going on, there'd be nothing to delay. There are delays, though, because of certain initiatives from the administration, such as DEI initiative, climate change initiatives, which imp introduce different impediments, which otherwise wouldn't be there. Moreover, everything what is DEI more expensive now because the of the energy policy of your administration. I mean, again, things are getting more expensive. The country's in the toilet. Your answer to what this is, is which DEI, which DEI initiative came from the Biden administration? Sorry. What did you say? What, what was it? Which DEI initiative came from the Biden administration that's slowing things down? The whole monster. Every, I mean, that's like the entire, <laughs> it's the way the whole thing works is you have to have different initiatives. I'm going to ask the same to question when you're done rambling. I just want to know what one policy or initiative from the Biden admin that was the DEI initiative that is affecting businesses. I'm going to ask the same thing when you do your platitudes when you're done. Just letting you know. I didn't hear. Okay, sorry. I didn't hear what you said. I'm in person. I did not hear that. What is what DEI initiative? What specific policy? What specific yes, regulation? Yes, I know. You're asking me for a source. Law? I am yes. not in front of my laptop. I cannot exactly name I didn't ask you for a source. Do you, you deny said, the existence said, of those sources, though? Are you saying there is no initiative? There is no DEI initiative or climate change initiative? I'm, I'm not, just making that up. There are no what, impediments. What, it would be the same under this administration as it would be under the Trump you administration. Said, Okay, well, the audience can decide for themselves. Like I said, it's empty platitudes. It means nothing. DEI initiatives, climate change initiatives, like none of these, they, they, these words are boogeymen. They mean nothing. You're, 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 you're just saying things that are supposed to be spooky and scary. Again, you, do you deny the existence of those? Just because I can't name specifically, those just don't exist. There's no DEI initiative. There's no climate change initiative. It's all just nonsense. I, when you say climate change initiative, I mean, climate change was a big part of the infrastructure bill. There's a lot of money that was allocated for certain types of right. infrastructure renewals that tended to favor, like, but are, are these bad? Are you saying that they, is this what you were referring to? Were you referring to the infrastructure bill when you said climate change initiatives? What yes, DEI initiatives are, were you referring to? I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Right. It's when a boogeyman. Doing, when you're doing something like constructing factories to build microprocessors, if there are initiatives in place that you have to go through, such as dealing with making sure everything is environmentally friendly and green, whatever that means. That's why even Biden said on the hot mic that this was just uh, their version of the Green New Deal. We got it done. 
done because it was environmentally oriented in the construction of those factories. That is to what I am referring, and that definitely is a real thing. Oh, I'm sorry, so the alternative were, is we should be making new factories that aren't environmentally friendly? Is that what you're seriously that's not, arguing obviously for? that's not what I mean. That's obviously not what I mean. I am simply saying that there are initiatives which exist under this administration which would not exist in other administrations, which could be why, uh, you know, in, in response to everything that's happened in this country, your big success is, well, we at least got the, the microprocessors underway. And it's like, okay, well, we have 15,000 convicted uh, murderers now who are in the country through the southern border because your president removed barricades that have enabled these people to now just flood into the country from we don't even know where. You know that 15,000 number, you're not accurately citing that, right? That 50, first of all, I think the number is 14,000, and that is with the totality of, of non-citizens that are in the country that have committed a violent crime. They didn't all come in in the four years that are Biden. You're making that up. You can, you can Google 14,000 uh, homicides or 14,000 violent crime and look up that number they, to pretend that they all came in. Also, what, they all came in through the southern border where, where, they, where, where um, the federal government, by the way, has exclusive purview to, to do immigration policy. That's where they all came in from. How would you even know that? Are they just watching them come in and writing them down on a notebook and then like e even the premise of this again is ridiculous it's all like boogeyman bullshit if you care about the border so much why are you happy that trump blocked the bill I, I, well because again that immigration bill was not actually addressing things substantially they were trying to score political points because americans are expressing anxiety about immigration which is to say they are unhappy with the way that the biden administration has handled it because again on day one you have to tell me why did he stop doing the things that trump had why did he halt the construction of the border wall why did he end remain in mexico why did he do things that would make it easier for people to come in through yes the southern border into our country what benefit does that serve to american citizens there is no yeah, so there, there is no, um, there was no border wall under Trump. It just never happened. There, no, nothing in Congress ever got done in regards to a border wall. So everything you're saying about that is, is fantastic. That's not delusion. true. He was building that new border, border bill. When you say the border bill was political points, killing the border bill was political points. Definitionally so. Donald Trump killed it to win politically. But to say that the bill was bad because it didn't address anything substantively, what's lacking in substance for more funding for asylum processes? What's lacking in substance for allocating more judges to uh, process immigrants? What's lacking in substance? Why, why did the border? support this bill what's lacking in substance to staffing the border with more agents to to defend our border which right. of these things are lacking in substance i think well because if you are if you are bringing more judges in to process these cases that does not mean that the cases are going to go in a way that i would like that just means these people are going to more easily be able to enter into the country it's not as though if you had more judges and more resources it would somehow be better able to secure itself as a southern border they would simply be allowed to in greater number and with more expediency waltz into the country and disappear into god knows where if you think that the goal of the judges is to just rubber stamp everybody coming in, then yes. why would Biden need to hire more judges at all? Wouldn't every single asylum judge just say, oh, you're in, oh, you're in, oh, you're in? No, Do you not want to process have, them? Which you why, know, how about you just say what you actually want? Because you want to shut down all immigration. Just say that. You don't want any immigrants coming in. Just say that. Be honest. Yeah, I've said, I've said that for five years. That is exactly my point. Okay. Yeah. Then, don't, then don't say the border bill lacks substance. Just say you disagree with it because you're opposed to immigration. Also, when you say American exceptionalism that you believe in, do you believe in American exceptionalism or British exceptionalism? American, because I don't understand what you mean when one. you say American exceptionalism and then you're anti-immigration. Like, yes. where do you think Americans come from? They come from other countries, right? Unless you live on a, on a Native American reservation and you want to see the expansion of, of their territory. Um, when America was becoming America, immigration was coming from a different part of the world, I think a part of the world that was approximately the size of Florida. Now we are getting people from, uh, we'll say, places that are maybe a little bit less compatible. And I don't think that they're assimilating very well, and I think that pretty much any metric by which you choose to evaluate that would vindicate the truth of that. And so when I say America doesn't need immigration, I don't mean America doesn't need people from Japan or people from Northwest Europe. I mean America probably doesn't need Haitians. That's specifically what I, I mean. agree. Sure. And I, I think that there is a large point of agreement there. I do think that there are a lot of immigrants that have trouble uh, assimilating to society today, but that's because half of the society that you want them to assimilate to possess no American values. And by that, I mean the conservative party. I expected to see uh, Spanish people, uh, uh, Haitian people, uh, wh whoever, uh, marching on the Capitol or marching to tear down this country, and that's not what I've seen. I've seen conservatives that are destructive to the country in every single way. You don't believe in the rule of law. You don't believe in how the government works. You don't care foundational American principles relating to liberalism, relating to respect the free speech of the media. These are the foundational core aspects that make you an American. And right now, the issue that we have is the conservative side of the country, not immigrants. It's not the people that are coming into the country and not eating the cats and dogs that are a threat. It's the people who are saying that they saw it on TV when it's not even happening. That's the thing that's undermining our democracy right now. I don't think that's true. I think that uh, the party which seeks to...
The party which seeks to conserve the Constitution is the one that, not coincidentally, is the one that's more aligned with voters which come from parts of the world, like I said. I mean, you can even see the data on this. The more conservative you are, the more likely you are to have been in this country in terms of your bloodline for a much longer time. You're talking about people from Germany, from the Netherlands, uh, from England, from wherever. They are assimilated much more than people who are coming from India, from wherever. And so, yeah, your ability to assimilate into a culture that is an outgrowth of Anglo-Saxon history is probably going to be linked somewhat to where you are descended from. And so, yeah, that doesn't come as a how many surprise times, to me at all. How many times has Biden or Kamala said that they wanted to uh, suspend the Constitution? Your party is the one writing about that, though. That's it. Obviously, I don't expect like I'm dark ask Brandon. The same question again obviously, I don't expect dark Brandon to come out as the commander in chief and be like, "We're going to su suspend the Constitution." But there are people still in the New Yorker. They just wrote a piece. This guy had been writing for the New Yorker for thirty years. Just the New Yorker isn't Biden or, or, or Kamala. The Harris. point is, the sentiment is media. coming from uh, so, your so side. The answer, that so the why... answer was Biden and Kamala have never said that. How many times on Truth Social has Donald Trump said that he would suspend the Constitution? And you have the audacity to say that the Republicans right now are the ones who care about rule of law. Yes. You yourself. We're talking about undermining yes. the entire structure of the government by having legislation from the executive. The executive legislates. He can do things with executive order. That's not part of the American understanding of how our government is supposed to work. And you're talking sure about a guy who said he wants to suspend the Constitution. What part of this is American? It's in the Constitution. I mean, Lincoln did it. FDR did it. You can certainly wield the power of the executive branch in accordance with the Constitution. The point being, I don't expect the leader of the party, be that Biden or Kamala, to get on stage and say the quiet part out loud, so to speak. But their Department of Justice still is going after patriots. They are still allowed to, in their media, write about how we should throw the Constitution out, as they just did in The New Yorker, a very prestigious publication, because the Constitution obviously can't stop somebody like Donald Trump, who is obviously such a horrible person. Therefore, we need to burn the, uh, the Constitution, which apparently you are suddenly so in favor of, if it means that we can stop Donald Trump. I mean, they've even they've said that he's, what, a threat to democracy for like four or five years he now? Is. He was in office. He is. And that's not what metastasis, that's not what ended up happening. He's, he left that office. That is what ended up happening. Fine. He tried to prevent the peaceful transfer of power by was. trying to defraud seven states. <laughs> that is exactly what happened. And that he failed and he lost and eventually he got kicked the fuck out. Right. When he you say the DOJ is going after the victory, Patriots, just do like you acknowledge that Donald Trump called Fox News and said, why isn't the DOJ indicting these people, that the DOJ needs to go after these people? True. Do you acknowledge that, that Donald Trump has tried to give direction to his DOJ in a way that you wish Biden was ever on record doing? Do you One acknowledge that Donald Trump has given direct direction to the Department of Justice to go after political adversaries? Do you acknowledge that's reality? I would use a different word than political adversary. I like it when the Department of Justice goes after um, disloyal R's. I don't like it when they go after MAGA patriots. That is sort of my axiom for viewing that. You're an authoritarian, and yeah. I don't okay. think that that's actually that hypocritical at all. Um, I think that it's completely in alignment with what needs to be done. Okay, I mean, it's, it, I mean, you're, you're an authoritarian, right? Yeah, you, nothing that about you is compatible with this country. If any sane immigration policy was ever created that tried to keep people away from this country that were antithetical to the idea of the American project, you would be at the top of the list in never being allowed here. Because what you believe in, what you want, is something that's more akin to the leadership structure of all the countries that you criticize. For no. some reason, you, you, you fall into the trap of thinking authoritarian dictatorships are good when I like the authoritarian dictator. But it's such an unbelievable position to sit here and say that the president of the United States should be allowed to direct the DOJ as long as he's going after the people that I think are really bad. Like, what an True. insane position to, to, to try to unironically defend while also pretending to be an American. It's insane to me. I don't think it's insane at all. I think it's what's happening right now under this administration. A really pithy response, John, and then we've got to wrap Every up. Every Immigration Act up until the Hart Seller Act in 1965, which was des uh, described as the greatest gift from the Kennedys to the Democrat Party, took into account the founding demographics, the American demographics of this country. The reason now, if you express attitudes that are antithetical to immigration, that you get pushback is because this country is not the same as it used to be. We have had 60 million people come to this country since 1965. We are now at record highs for a percentage of our overall population, which is foreign born. The people here are not Americans. So yeah, it doesn't surprise me when a guy comes out and says, hey, we should probably take it easy on immigration. I don't know if these people are compatible with American culture, that these people who are now enfranchised as if they are equal to Americans are going to push back against that. It doesn't surprise me at all. This is a good opportunity to jump into the Q&A as we're already over for the open dialogue portion. So the way that the Q&A will work, folks, is in this middle aisle here, if you want to come up, it's really important that you stand on this first tape line right here. And then it's also important that if you want to give a setup for your question, like one or two sentences, that's okay, but it really has to be one or two sentences, and I even have to be kind of pushy about that, and I even have to hold the mic just to be sure. So, floor is all yours with the first question. 
Uh, hi, John. This is my question for you. Um, I have a couple friends on both sides of the aisle. One of them is we can vote the right people into power. We put the right people in uh, state, local, and federal levels. If we do that, we'll be able to take our country back. The other side says, no, we've got to crash and burn this thing. We've got to start over from scratch. So uh, my question for you is, at what point is it too late? Well, certainly not now. Um, there is this mindset that I think is very tempting to especially young men, uh, you know, <laughs> because we sort of like to... Um, uh, like, for example, any, you know, you probably have a relationship with drywall, right? And it's like you sort of get mad and you just want to. That, I think, can translate politically as well. It can sort of map where it's like, I'm very frustrated with the way things are going. What if everything just collapsed? It does not make it easier to win when you start losing worse. There are plenty of countries you can look to right now. South Africa, I guess, would maybe be the most obvious example where things get worse for them politically. And I mean, they're having blackouts, they're having riots, but still things are more or less functioning. Total collapse is not something I think that we should aspire to. Um, I think that. The solution is much longer. It requires a lot more work, and it requires a lot of patience and sort of thinking that, you know, if we lose, somehow people will wake up and then we can win. Uh, I don't think that's true at all. I mean, look at how things are now. The idea that there's like some sleeper cell remnant of patriots who aren't quite getting what's going on now, who once things reach a certain point, they will wake up and then we can finally take the country back. I don't think that's true. I think there are opportunities right now. And the best thing you can do other than get involved locally, which you'd be surprised at how successful you can be with that, is to cast a vote for, uh, for Donald J. Trump in November. So I think there is a, a political solution. I think there's a path forward. And I think the evidence to that is how much opposition this guy has faced. I mean, if things were really going to continue into our managed decline into a third world nation, then you know we'd be struggling to get excited about the Bush-Haley ticket right now. But we have Donald Trump, and they've tried to stop Trump. Uh, by the grace of God, a gust of wind saved Donald Trump. And you know the golf incident just a few weeks ago. So I think that there's a very real threat that he poses to whatever it is that's going on in this country, which everyone seems to recognize on an intuitive level, but maybe we don't want to get into the specifics of when it comes to, I guess, more uh, polarizing political issues or what have you. But I think it's real, and I think there is a way to uh, make America great again by supporting him. Hi. Uh, thank you both for being here. Um, so my question's for Destiny. And I tried to keep track throughout this debate just because I noticed something. I was kind of curious about it. As far as I could count, you mentioned Kamala Harris's name six times in the entire time you were able to speak once in your opening statement, um, which is surprising to me because, as I understand it, you are arguing in the infirm affirmative that she should be the president. If it was the nature of this debate or something that led you not to be able to argue because of that, and you were more so arguing against Trump, I want to open this up to you to ask, why Kamala? I know why not Trump, why you're saying that, but why vote for Kamala? Because I don't think you've really made that argument. The honest argument is we live in a two-party system right now. And at the end of the day, you're either going to vote for Trump or you're going to vote for Kamala Harris. Uh, you can have not voting for one party or you can have a positive to vote for another party. These are the way that elections work. Uh, Republicans can pretend it's different, but Steve Bannon, when he came under Trump's campaign, uh, he knew this. I think Bannon had 88 days to go until the election. And when Bannon was brought on, he noticed something that unlike all of the people that are sycophantically obsessed with Donald Trump that believe that he's a super popular president, he's not. Donald Trump has never been a popular president. He's just really popular in the Republican Party. That's why when Bannon came on, they uh, they did things like the laptop story and everything for Hunter Biden, because they knew that the only way you could actually win the election was to drive the negatives up of the other party rather than trying to make your own candidate more likable. Nobody on the other side likes Donald Trump. Uh, it, it, <laughs> even Republicans have to be gradually accept them at times. Uh, I wish that there was more conversation about policy in the United States. To be totally honest, Kamala Harris probably sits either quite a bit or a little bit to the left of me when it comes to economic policy, but Republicans have decided that we're not going to have policy conversations in this country. When Donald Trump won't say what he wants to do for foreign policy because he says it's top secret, when Donald Trump is given policy questions and he has no answer, when you go on to Donald Trump's website and you read the policy stuff and it says things like we're going to slash inflation by making homes more affordable and that's it, you don't really get to talk about any policy. There's no policy to talk about. I wish we could have more policy debate and more policy conversation, but I basically just look at the four years under Biden. I look at what the policy was there, and I'd say it's probably going to be similar to Harris, and then I compared to the four years under Trump, which I think were catastrophic and pushed this nation to the edge. Uh, and I'd say I probably don't want to repeat that. And then broadly speaking, I think that's why I support Kamala Harris as president. Uh, hey, uh, my question is for John. I also just really quickly wanted to say that, like, as a theater kid, I'm very offended and triggered and woke by <laughs> your comments. But I will also say you probably should try theater. I think you'd really like do well on stage. Um, my question's just, 
<laughs> my question's just, um, I go out canvassing a lot, and I talk to a lot of black people, and a lot of them feel like they're not being represented by the Democratic Party too much. So could you try to sell me on why Republicans are good for black people? I am going to have to reach deep into the bowels of my mind to find my Dinesh D'Souza education. This is like 10 years old at this point. Like, why are the left the real Nazis again? This is very old school stuff. Uh, but it is true, like unironically. I mean, if you look, for example, under Trump, people who are maybe in this room supporting Trump even were agitated by how much Trump was talking about, how great he was for, for black voters. But it is true. I mean, you're looking at real net worth. You're looking at jobs, things like that. I mean, I know recently he got in trouble for saying black jobs, but it is true there are jobs which disproportionately are uh, going towards African Americans, towards blacks, and so those can be black jobs, and I don't think that's a big issue. And he was just better. I mean, income was higher, wealth was higher, crime was lower, black communities were safer up until the riots in the summer of 2020. And I just frankly don't see what the other side has to offer. I mean, that's my side, but if we can even just you know support that because the opposition is so bad, what do Democrats have to offer black people? Black people have voted in blocks for Democrats for decades. Black communities have gotten less safe, there's less money, less homeownership. I mean, things have obviously not gotten better, um, yet the rate of voting for uh, the Democrats in the black community still remains very high. And so I, I sort of almost echo the Trump statement, which I think was in 2016, which got him in trouble, where he's like, what do you have to lose? I mean, if things clearly are not going well now, um, why would you not try to maybe experiment with what the opposition has to, to offer? And even when they didn't vote for him um, in, you know, by majority by far in 2016, you still look at the way black America was doing in 2016 through 2020 versus how they've been doing for the last four years, and it's measurably better, and it's not even close. Are we allowed to respond to questions too, if they're word for us explicitly? Uh, I could give the question asker a quick response if you'd like, but Destiny, I hate oh. to say it, but I, I, gotta, I have to keep the rebuttals to an absolute minimum, even among the audience. But I want to give you a okay. chance if you do have a rejoinder. Go ahead. Uh, not quite convinced yet, but I'll look into what you're saying. I think that uh, there's a lot of hesitancy among minorities to support Republicans because there is a very sophisticated media apparatus which goes to convince everybody that racism is like very prevalent on uh, the Republican side. Therefore, if we vote for racism, we're going to have that come back to bite us. But I mean, I don't see the fruits of that anywhere. I've never seen anything uh, like a policy, for example, which can you know demonstrate the viability of that. So. Just remember, audience guy, whatever, you sound like if you're a black person, ask the question, right? He, he wants to see less of your kind of people in this country when John Doyle is answering this question. If somebody shows the border looking like you, he doesn't want people that look like you to come to this country. Just as a heads up. That's not true because when I referenced the immigration policy, black Americans were already here. I'm talking about Indians and Chinese and all these other people, so. I have to, I have to move us to the, I, to the I, next By question. the way, I love, Nobody, I, I I'm literally a black person expert, Jim, which my audience will know. Nobody has more love and respect for black I, America than myself. Just to keep this in the Q&A. Knowing all the slurs doesn't make you a black you. person expert. We're all right, we're all right. Just so we can hear the next question, folks. Uh, for John, in 2016, you mentioned one of Trump's greatest hits when he took uh, Jeb Bush to account for his uh, flipping his opinion on uh, the Iraq war. And you mentioned a little bit about Trump's foreign policy in terms of what it might look like for Ukraine. Uh, what is your understanding about his, uh, maybe what a Trump uh, presidency in 2024 might look like for Israel, particularly with his relationship with Miriam Adelson? Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, the Adelsons, for example, gave him, I think, $100 million or something in 2016. I think now the widow is going to give him $120 million. And to me, I don't think that there's actually, I mean, I had to hear this in 2016 as well. There were a lot of alt-right guys at the time who were looking at the relationship between Trump and the Adelsons, and they were calling him just like they are now, Zion Don. They're saying that he's just going to be an Israeli puppet. And you look at how that actually played out. By the way, calling him a Zionist the way that they would call George Bush a Zionist or Barack Obama, like pretending that's all the same thing. You look at how that played out, and okay, he relocated an embassy, and then we have a photograph taken out a wall, which now I have to see is like the reason why he's supposedly such a sellout. You look at what's going on right now in the Middle East. I understand as we speak, Israel is launching an invasion, I suppose, a ground invasion into Lebanon. Um, but we're hearing that there's going to be World War III. We've been hearing that with Iran forever. It's never metastasized. I don't think that it will. And uh, I don't think that Trump is beholden to these interests the way that people like to think that he is. I think Trump looks at everything through the lens of the art of the deal. And if people are willing to give him $100 million instead of the other, 
other guy, he's willing to say, yeah, and what leverage do they really have? I mean, okay, given the money, now what? Israel wants sovereignty over the West Bank? How does that affect me as, a, as an American patriot? I mean, you could say maybe it'll escalate tensions in the Middle East. As Destiny mentioned, we killed like their top guy and they didn't do anything. They rose the flag. They said, we're gonna get you, America. They didn't do anything. So I'm frankly, I'm not worried about it. And yeah, if they wanna write Trump a check for $100 million to make it easier for him to get elected, I don't see the obvious downsides to that, which weren't iterated in 2016 as like guarantees, things that were gonna happen. So I just don't think it's an issue to be honest. And by the way, I have thought about that quite a lot online. I put my reputation behind that. If Trump ends up um, going to war with the Middle East on behalf of Israel, I'll be the first one to get up and say, I was wrong. But I noticed the people who are doing the opposite, saying that you know Trump is totally a slave to the Israel lobby. They kept their mouths shut and never apologized for saying those things about the man who's now taken a bullet for them. So I will put my reputation behind that. But I noticed that Trump's detractors will not do the same. Just to be clear, Trump didn't take the bullet. He passed it off to the dude behind him. So I don't know where this is. Which you joked about, by the way. From. You thought that was like the funniest thing ever. <laughs> this guy cares so much about democratic institutions, but when like an official presidential candidate is shot at and then the guy behind him gets killed, he makes jokes about it on Twitter. I was lying at you saying he took the bullet. He clearly didn't take it. He passed it along. He, took, he was injured. He we was hit by the bullet. Forward. What happened to his ear? Gentlemen. He got hit by the Gentlemen, Secret Service I guy. I don't think he got shot at all. Hi, John. I'm Ryan. Uh, I'm a startup engineer, a scout of 12 years, and I align strongly with your strongest values. Earlier, you mentioned you were surprised to see immigrants in Ohio because they were apples and oranges with the people there. As the son of immigrants, I'm curious about how you feel about families like mine standing proudly shoulder to shoulder with the men of Ohio, the good men of Ohio. I have no issue with immigrants. Um, if Destiny will put me to a position where he's like, John, no one wants no immigration, then I'm gonna be like, so true. But it's not so much immigration that's the issue, it's where the immigrants are coming from. And I, do you mind if I ask where your family's from? Cuba. Yeah, so no, I mean- No, tell them your position before any answers. Cuba, when you, which immigrants don't you want coming here? Cuban Americans are historically one of the most conservative demographics in the country. So do I have an issue with Cuban Americans simply because they are from Cuba? No, I have an issue with people who manifestly are not able to assimilate into American culture. And you look at almost any other ethnic group in the country, aside from Cubans and some African Name ethnicities, them. Which ones? examples, they are not voting for the country which Cuban wants to conserve. Cuban isn't an ethnic group, that's a national Steven. They are not voting Steven. for the party which wants to conserve the country. They are block voting for Democrats because they want to make America more like the countries from which they came, which is to say wealth redistribution, socialism, inflation, crime, everything like that, because they are not able to pull themselves up by their bootstraps like other groups are, for example. And so right. I have no issue with that. Uh, thank you, John, especially because your clip, your clip compilation will help me convert the rest of my family to liberals. I appreciate it. Right. So we've seen uh, quite an escalation in the Middle East with Israel attacking Hezbollah. How does either candidate plan to try to stop Israel from dragging us into World War III with Iran? either through like stopping supporting arms deals to Israel or just you know actually having a ceasefire deal that Netanyahu's not just going to reject after Hamas or Hezbollah accepts it. I don't think that the right-wing Israelis have nearly the leverage that they think they do. I mean, I understand that there are donors in this country who will give money to Trump's campaign, but Netanyahu politically is not very popular right now. I mean, he is wrestling to maintain, uh, maintain control of his leadership as well in Israel, and I think that he feels as though if the war comes to an end or he, if he takes his foot off the gas, so to speak, uh, he may be in trouble politically speaking, and so he certainly has an incentive to escalate. But I think Trump, as he said, he remembers that Netanyahu betrayed him and immediately called and congratulated Joe Biden on winning the presidency. And Trump even said, I think, in a, in a leaked uh, audio recording or a leaked, you know, from one of the staffers that he said, like, yeah, Netanyahu betrayed me, F him. So he clearly remembers that. And even, you know, when Netanyahu came to visit, for example, there was clear tension between the two. Trump was talking about the war in a way that Netanyahu was not exactly a fan of. The way that he did also with Zelensky, saying basically he's going to approach it as a businessman and not, you know, be beholden to these interests necessarily. So um, I think the question of World War III is not only the question of how we operate on our hand, I think it's also what threat is actually posed. I think that largely the Middle East threat is a paper tiger. I think that they are a lot of talk and not a lot of action. And every time that they've said that they're definitely going to do something this time, it just hasn't actually been what's happened. And so I think that there are more pressing issues that we should worry about um, as Americans that affect us domestically. And yeah, I simply don't think that Trump views his job as commander in chief to be beholden to foreign interests. I think that again, in 2016 through 2020, when he was in, in office, he really didn't do that so much uh, with the Israelis besides moving an embassy, taking a photo at a wall. But you know, he wasn't in there like George Bush, for example, like willing to put boots on the ground to destabilize the Middle East. Um, he repeated 
repudiated that, and he took control of the party and realigned the position so that we all have to be against that. Whereas, as I mentioned earlier, prior to Trump, your level of republicanist, uh, republicanism was measured by how willingly and vocally in support of those wars uh, you are. So I think that uh, it's just a completely different ballgame now. Destiny, do you have an answer to the question? Um, yeah, I'm going to be honest. Uh, I went over to Israel for two weeks, and after talking to a lot of Palestinians on the ground there, I would say that Donald Trump makes me really nervous when it comes to Israel because I've never seen a more uh, a more zoggy type president. Uh, it makes me really worry that I think Donald Trump ordered that hit on Soleimani. He was the leader of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, which is responsible for a lot of the international meddling that goes along, uh, you know, inside of Israel. He su supported Hezbollah. He supported the Houthis. He supported Hamas. And I kind of wonder if Donald Trump only ordered that assassination because of the hundred million dollars that Adelson and other APAC donors sent to his campaign. I know Donald Trump is on record saying publicly that he is Israel's strongest supporter. Um, I know that Donald Trump created a position in the White House and sent his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, to the Middle East to negotiate peace deals for Israel. I don't know why the United States is risking itself to make peace agreements for Israel, for other uh, countries between them and Israel. Um, and then I know that the, the not, you know, we talk about moving the embassy and recognizing, I think it was like America it was like one of three countries to do that. I thought that was really weird. And along with that, I think Trump was also willing to go along with Netanyahu when Netanyahu was talking about cutting UNRWA funding and everything to the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. And I don't think that Donald Trump did anything to hold Israel accountable for any of its behavior in the Middle East. So I think one of the things that I'm the most worried about when it comes to Donald Trump and foreign policy is he definitely comes off as kind of like an Israeli Jewish puppet. And that just makes me really nervous, I think. I'd rather have somebody like Kamala Harris, uh, who seems to be really critical of Israel and their foreign policy and seems to be a lot less bought and paid for by, uh, you know, people of the, of the Torah. All right, this question is for John. Oh, thank you. All right, this question is for John. I listened to your content for the first time while I was driving over here, and I had a bunch of questions listening to it, but then you said something earlier on in the debate. Could you repeat the number you said of how much of, um, of uh, Joe Biden and Kamala's cabinet has stepped down so far? Uh, Kamala Harris had like a turnover rate for her staff that was 92%, I believe. 92%. 92 now, that was for Kamala or the Biden administration? The one running for president. So, the Biden administration? No, for Kamala Harris specifically, because we're talking about whether she has leadership capabilities. Mm -hmm. Her staff, as her vice presidential staff, had a 92% turnover rate. Okay. And when you compare that to a 98% turnover rate for Donald Trump, including 13 members of a cabinet, what do you have to say right. about that? Uh, again, it's a completely different assignment. Donald Trump is going oh, to... Oh, okay. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on, hold yeah. on. You can't, you can't just say, oh, it's different. I, I do want to give him a chance to answer the it question. It absolutely is. What a Democrat administration is looking to do is different from what a nationalist administration is looking to do. If you're looking to hire from the swamp to fill a nationalist administration, it's going to be a lot more difficult to do that. You're going to be working with neocons, career politicians who are completely misaligned with that agenda, and they're not going to want to have their reputation stained by working for what is viewed to be an irritant by the Republican establishment. If you're Kamala Harris, you're the establishment. You have the blessing of the establishment. The DNC staged literally a coup to put you in as opposed to Joe Biden. Everything she wants to do is more or less an extension of the same political orthodoxies we've had in this country for 60 years. So to me, looking at the situation, I don't understand why anybody would want to not get to say, I worked for Vice President Harris, other than she's simply like a completely unlikable person, which makes sense too, because you hear leaks about her breaking down. She's always drunk. She has to LARP these dinners prior to meeting with diplomats because she's a wreck. She's like always on Adderall, and she just seems to be a complete mess. And so, yeah, I don't view it the same way. I would challenge you to not view it as simply, oh, Democrats this, but Republicans this. I think there's more at play going on. I think there's another axiom for how we have to view our political establishment, which is simply the establishment versus the patriots, versus nationalists, people who want to put America first, versus people who want to basically manage the decline of our country until everybody else in the world gets to pick at the bones of our civilization. And then just real quick, the, the establishment yes. is not the New York City billionaire, right? Sorry? So the New York City billionaire isn't part of the establishment? I don't think the establishment's necessarily uh, uh, yeah, that's what I thought. geographic, you know? <laughs> it doesn't have to be. It's, you know, what do they call it? The cathedral, right? So. Uh, are we John. talking about Kamala Harris' staff turnover? What, what staff are we talking about here? Kamala's White House staff had like a 92% turnover rate. Why would we compare Kamala Harris's staff of the office of the vice presidency to somebody's cabinet? Because she's never been the president, and so if we are trying to find a metric by which to predict her leadership capabilities, the people who are working with her every day, I think, is a worthwhile metric to explore. Do you even know the responsibilities that the office of the vice presidency has? Why would we compare the people that are working as staffers as part of that small office, as part of the executive branch, to the cabinet, the top-level people for your offices and departments? 
if she can't bring people on to like stay with her and like write policy and little debate quips or whatever, I don't think that she would be able to keep people on in a cabinet, uh, let alone anybody of quality who would actually do things that benefit us as opposed to what they have done, which is make us poorer, less safe, and more of a playground for the rest of the world, which is like literally what has happened and which you have not addressed. So if Donald Trump can't maintain his personal sure. relations with lawyers can, or his staff, and he's losing all of his businesses, and he wasn't able to maintain his cabinet, what faith do we have that Donald Trump can hold on to cabinet members of the future? Give you a chance to respond, John, and then we've got to go to the next question. Because I am aware of what is happening mechanically with Trump's next, next administration, and that inspires confidence. It's a in non-answer. It doesn't mean anything. We'll go to the next question. Uh, John, I wanted to confirm before I ask, are you Catholic? Yes. Uh, so you talk a lot about assimilation, people from the wrong countries can't really come here to assimilate into our culture, sure. but Catholics were widely rejected for a long time, so I was wondering how you kind of justify those two things. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm a Catholic, I, I believe in Catholic theology, but I don't necessarily mean or think that that means that we have to open the world to anybody who's Catholic. I mean, Haiti, for example, I keep mentioning is 52% Catholic. That's more than twice as Catholic as America is. I think that uh, the biggest challenge to Christian anthropology is that a lot of people who claim to be Christians or to be Catholics are not viewing that in the same way that European Christians view it. And so I don't think it's enough to say these people can come into the country because they are Catholic, um, like a lot of people in Latin America, for example, because if you look at how they vote, how they express their religious values politically, they are still voting overwhelmingly for Democrats, which are a party that literally celebrates a repudiation of those values. I mean, at the DNC, uh, they had a truck that was giving out uh, circumcisions and like birth control and all sorts of things like that, which if you're a Catholic, I mean, you cannot support that in any capacity. But for some reason, these demographics which are coming here from these countries, which are supposedly so Catholic, are more in alignment with the Democrat party than they are with the Republican party. I think it's something like 51% of white Catholics are supporting Trump. 61% of Hispanic Catholics are supporting Harris. Someone's wrong there. Someone is directionally incorrect there. Um, and so I don't view it to say, you know, you can't come into the country because uh, you're, it's just, I, I see it for what it is. It's not necessarily um, a religious thing, I don't think. It's more of how that actually manifests with what we see and what's going on. And I think there have been plenty of popes and saints who have expressed similar sentiments to my own. Okay. Wait, hold on. If we're if Catholicism is the important part here, wouldn't the Pope being uh, pro-immigrant, the Pope who's made statements saying that we need to accept migrants more, wouldn't this be something as a Catholic that's probably the most important thing for you to accept in your life as well? No, I mean, if you want me to Pope explain, we can Pope explain, but uh, I, I don't think that's true. Okay, that's fine if you want to Pope explain. Because to be clear, he's made statements, Catholic, then, you know, right? Because the Pope is the head of the Catholic Church, and if you want to you betray or if you want to fight against any statements on morality or faith, of right. which the Pope in the Catholic teachings has infallibility when he speaks on matters of faith, right? You know this, yes, of faith or morality. Yes. The Pope. Why, will, how could you possibly call yourself a Catholic? Because the Pope will say one day that we should, you know, not turn away the poor and we should take care of them. And then he will say other days countries can have borders; they can enforce immigration policies. It simply depends on which statement of his you want to take, uh, depending upon which day. So I don't think that my view on immigration is misaligned with the church teaching or uh, the teaching from Pope Francis. That's yeah, pretty heretical joiner. to me. I don't know. Uh, I was more concerned with like Catholics that are already here renouncing their faith to become more like Protestant America that was founded. You talked about going back to America's roots. Yeah. Renou so renouncing Catholics that are already here, renouncing their faith. I don't renounce Catholics who are here. Okay. Thank if that's, you. Yeah. First of all, thanks guys for deciding to hold this debate at the very best of the Big Ten campuses. My question is addressed to both of you. Uh, given the significant conflicts happening across the globe, foreign policy wonks are worried that China is going to inevitably invade China. I, I mean, no, sorry, ta Taiwan. And if this does end up happening, what makes your respective candidates best equipped to handle this conflict? I went first. Uh, I thought that we were going to segue. Tell well, me what to do. Who's going first? Oh, we'll, start with, we'll start with John. Okay. Um, I, I simply don't think that if Trump is in office, that's a, a threat that is um, existing to the extent that it does now when Biden's in office. I think that there have been foreign policy failures under the Biden administration, which essentially put up a flag uh, letting other countries know that we are in a state of relative weakness and they can act more in accordance with their interests because they don't have to worry about America stepping up to the plate to defend their allies the way that they would under a Trump administration, for example. I mean, you look at what's going on in Israel, look at what's going on uh, between uh, Ukraine and Russia. Um, I mean, you could see something maybe pop off, probably not within this timeline because we're like, what, a month out from the election, but I don't think that China would try to do something like that under a Trump presidency. I just simply don't. Uh, I mean, if you look at the foreign policy disposition of this country right now, I think that 
Uh, somebody like Donald Trump is your greatest hope if you're China. Donald Trump has no ability to mobilize the United States to have any kind of coherent foreign policy vision because I think Donald Trump lacks an overall vision for America. I think when you look at the broad picture between Harris and Trump, and I'll speak of it abstractly, uh, this is something the conservative has done in this debate, uh, on an abstract level, the problem with Trump is that he doesn't really have a vision for the United States because he has no understanding of history, he has no understanding of geopolitics, he has no understanding of the larger structures at play, uh, meaning he doesn't know why America America is uh, the foreign policy leader, or where American um, hegemonic dominance comes from. He doesn't. He doesn't know what NATO is or what it's for. He thinks there's probably a NATO army that everybody pays money towards that America was getting ripped off for. It. That's the extent he knows about it. And Donald Trump doesn't see where America fits in internationally into the world order. That America should be maintaining peace and stability across, especially Europe, uh, if not other parts of the world. So when Donald Trump comes into office, you know we get these empty platitudes again, like, uh, oh well, under Donald Trump these things would never happen. Which things? Uh, because Bashar al-Assad continued to gas his citizens, that's why Trump bombed the airport. Um, Iran attacked Saudi Arabia, that's why Trump went after Soleimani. Um, uh, you know, uh, Russia remained in Crimea, they didn't retreat at all there, they continued to fund the civil war in the Donbass. Um, so this idea that like people wouldn't do things under, the, under Donald Trump, is, it's just nonsense. It, it just shows that you either don't know history, you don't know the history of 2016 to 2020, uh, or, you're, or you're, well, more likely you're being malicious and you're just lying and trying to present something um, in, in a disingenuous way to try to run away from all of Trump's failures. Uh, I would much rather have somebody with a coherent vision for where America sits at in the world, and I think everybody else would fear and respect this more, rather than Donald Trump that comes off like a schizophrenic chihuahua who is only nice to people that, you know, pet him last. Thank you. So my question is for Stephen and maybe John as well, because I hope he'd be against foreign interference. Uh, given recent controversy around certain figures on the right, like Tim Pool, Benny Johnson, and possibly more to soon be uncovered, receiving Russian money for their coverage, I wanted to ask, are there any reforms you would support to stem anti-American influence, foreign or otherwise? Um, on one, so I'll go from less extreme to more extreme. I think the least extreme that I think should be proposed to Congress that I think people should genuinely support is if you are any major media player, whether you're alternative media or mainstream media, you should have to disclose who your funding sources are from. Whether that means to the federal government or some third party organization or even publicly, I don't know what that looks like, but there has to be some sort of disclosure going on, I think. I think that's number one. Um, for a more extreme version, I think that any large social media account that is reporting on or um, commentating on uh, domestic politics in the United States, that account should be unmasked. Or at the very least, we should know the nationality of that account. Uh, I think that every single American citizen has a compelling interest to know. Uh, I think it would be very interesting to see if, say, the top 10 Democrat accounts, you found out that nine of them were Chinese, or if the top 10 conservative media accounts, you found out that nine of them were Russian. I think that people wanted, would want to know that. I think it would benefit all of us, uh, and I think it would do a, a greater service to the concept of freedom of speech and open discourse and open dialogue, rather than having a bunch of people operating under these anonymous masks, taking money from foreign uh, dictators, and, and trying to screw with our media environment in order to push forth, you know, essentially the destruction of this country. Um, I would agree with a lot of that. I would not agree with any measure that seeks to reduce uh, the availability of anonymous accounts to people on the internet. I think that Twitter is the only place where free speech really exists right now on the internet, and there's certainly a lot of very, very influential Twitter accounts who have done a lot to move the conversation politically, especially on the right, and so I would not support any measure that seeks to unmask them because these people have jobs and families, and as we've seen, when they dox people, they arrest them for memes such as Ricky Vaughn. Uh, you have instances where these things can get pretty ugly pretty quickly, so I wouldn't support that. I also would maybe just add an asterisk. I don't really like the idea of thinking that foreign money in politics is like the worst thing ever. Not because I support foreign money in politics, but because I don't want people to become under the impression that that is the problem in itself. That there's not a lot of American money, money that funnels through this country, which is not itself problematic and acting against the interests of American people, because there's plenty of that. So I don't think it's enough to say foreign money is bad. It's, you have to sort of, I think, go a little bit further and say any money that acts against the interests of the American people uh, is bad and should be um, punished. If you're opposed to the doxing, does that mean you disavow libs of TikTok? Because that's an account that frequently and regularly doxes people that have political views that they disagree with? Libs of TikTok? If I disavow them? No, I don't disavow them. OK, so then you don't care about doxing. That was a total lie. No, they uh, dox. When you say that X is an open platform for freedom of speech, what do you feel about the J.D. Vance dossier that has been uh, stripped from the X one that had a social security a number and I don't dox I don't support uh, disavowing libs of TikTok because they dox evil people people who are going after exactly the kind of people who oh, I'm speaking about so it's a completely different thing fascist authoritarian speech that's what I like right. as long as they're evil people 
Uh, there are no bad tactics, yes. only bad Yes, targets. these are people who want to mutilate the genitals of children. These are you bad know. people. They have to go. Mm -hmm. Check one. Uh, let's see. We... We'll just have to speak. There. Okay. Do you have a quick rebuttal? No, I think the, both answers spoke for themselves. Thank you very much. And then this is actually going to be our last question that we can take. Hi, um, I have a question for uh, John Doyle. Um, previously, you stated that many American or many immigrants that came out from 1960 were from countries who are culturally incompatible with the United States. Uh, both my roommates in Penn State are actually first-generation immigrants. One of which is from um, Trinidad and Tobago, the other which is from Nigeria, who was actually personally subject to the Trump Muslim ban in 2016. Both of these men are graduating in the springtime and will be serving in the U.S. Army as, um, after they finish their ROTC uh, vows. So these two um, Americans, because they're both American citizens, um, are they any less American than you, John Doyle, despite their vow to fight and die for this country? Uh, well, it's a great question. I think I would first say that we don't make policy based on the exception. We should make it when we do make it based on what tends to happen. And your friends are obviously exceptions, but if we let in, say, a million people from their respective countries of origin, you would not see that same result. Um, and so I don't think it's a question of whether or not they are just as American as I am, because if they're expressing similar sentiments, I mean, for all intents and purposes, the way that you would, I guess, measure our patriotism or something would more or less be equal. The problem is, when you open up the gates to people from those countries, you don't see the same thing. So am I more American than your friends because they just got here and my ancestors have been here since 1701. I could see an argument for that, but I'm a nice guy, so I like to be inclusive. However, since they're willing to you know, sacrifice for this country, uh, maybe we would make an exception. But again, we don't like to make exceptions. We want to go based on what tends to happen. And what tends to happen is that when you allow for demographics who are coming from countries that are more alien to the United States, they tend to express their political sentiment in ways which are disadvantageous to Native Americans, to people who built this country. And I can't support that as a patriot. Is there a single white European country that whose immigrants vote conservatively? Repeat that. Is there a single white European country whose immigrants come over here and vote for conservatives? Just one? Not by majority, uh, but if you still so look that at means like that you would be opposed to all immigrants. Sure. I'm saying that, like I said, okay. like I said earlier, no, no, if you're no, looking that's at that's data, that's of no, no. You, immigrant said, you said you said what you said earlier was you don't want anybody coming over. You don't want to talk about the exception. You want to talk about the rule. And the yes. rule is is what we have to look at what people do in the aggregate. And statistically speaking, because you keep you keep making this like white person reference, which is a very, by the way, a very American. Um, I don't know what you'd say, mutt race thing to do for people that don't have clear ancestry because they're just American, is you have this weird fascination with white Europeans like they would come over here and vote conservatives. I know a lot of people from France, uh, from Sweden, from Norway. You think these people come to the United States? They're the whitest motherfuckers in the world. Do you think these people are coming to the United States and voting for Trump? No, and you just admitted it. So you would ban all immigrants because there's no immigrant group, <laughs> except for Cubans, I guess, unfortunately for you, I guess, that actually come over here and vote for the horrible party that you're a part of. So why not just say I want to ban all immigration? Right, I mean, as I've said tonight, as I've said for five years, I don't support immigration. I want an immigration moratorium. When we're talking about historical immigration trends, the demographics which have become more assimilated in the sense that they express their political desires by voting for the party which wants to conserve America are groups that have deeper roots in this country. Germans, Scots-Irish, groups like that, WASPs. These are groups which express what they want the future to look like by aligning themselves more in accordance with the party which seeks to conserve it. And these other groups which, yeah, they come to America in 2024 as a, you know, a Nord. I don't expect them necessarily to, to hop on the Trump train. But if you're talking about historical immigration patterns, that is definitely true. I can give you a quick rebuttal. Well, how can you say, I don't understand how you can say when you, when you don't conserve America, when you want to go back to other times that you're just arbitrarily choosing. Like, when you say, for instance, you say, well, the Irish have a deep history in America. Irish and Italians, when they came over through Ellis Island, didn't have as deep of a history in the United States. In fact, they formed a lot of ghettos and they formed a lot of in-groups and yeah. a lot of people that were native in the United States didn't like those people either. So I where give you a response the when you talk about conserving America? I want to give John a response and then I go to the next question. Irish and Italians have assimilated into this country. Uh, the only thing that would differentiate them would be maybe a St. Patrick's Day celebration or a pasta night, but if you look at how they manifest themselves, they are more or less assimilated uh, without you know, meaningful difference. Other groups don't exactly express that, even if they've been here for two or three generations, like you see with uh, Chinamen. So. All right, Wait, I'm going to give you a question. question. I, Wait, I hate to do, do this, Stephen. Well, just one Steven. quick question for, for him. Who do you think had a more extensive operation in the United States, MS-13 or the Mafia? What, what, what was it? Who has more roots in the United States? Who had, an, who had a more extensive criminal enterprise operation in the United States, MS-13 or the Mafia? 
And the mafia w existed a long time. Uh, MS-13 has only been a problem in this country for the last 10, 15, 20 years. So I, okay. I don't think that you can equate that, especially if we're talking about a 2024 presidential election. I want to give you a quick rebuttal. All right. I just want to say that I'm, I'm from Erie County. Um, it's a county known for having a high asylum seeker population. Um, for example, my grandparents with next to Syrian refugees who were personally tortured by the Assad regime. And when I speak to these people who have immigrated to America um, and they sing its praises, they have personally made me more prouder to be American than you have, John Doyle. Do want to, do want to remind you folks, we are looking for questions rather than, we're looking for questions more than statements. Next gentleman. Hello. Hello. Oh. That guy's really proud of himself. Um, I'd just like to say, um, I'd like to ask a question to specifically John Dole first. So I heard you say something about, uh, what is it, theater-occupied government earlier. True. Um, could you maybe elaborate on that? It's just a, you know, uh, there's a joke on the internet, and it's just a joke, it's obviously not real, uh, where people throw around this term ZOG, Zionist Occupied Government, which is a way of describing the way our government uh, functions. I amended that to theater kid occupied government because I think it's a more accurate way of sort of assessing the type of person who works in government, who works in DC. And I think that's true, I think I can stand by that. It's essentially to say the type of person who gets involved in politics nowadays, working in DC as a staffer, um, as a policymaker, or whatever, these tend to be people who are very, sort of um, interested in whatever status working in DC can offer to them. They themselves are not necessarily exceptional and accomplished. These are people who strive to become policymakers to work in DC. They will starve them. I mean, if anyone here knows people working in DC with these kinds of jobs, they're not making very much money. Uh, they don't eat very well, and they're pretty much miserable, very anxious all the time, but they enjoy working in DC because they like being able to go back and report something home for Thanksgiving. And so I think that that is a focus of getting involved in politics that is not necessarily to make meaningful change, but rather because they simply enjoy the feeling that it brings them. Sort of like someone who is performing like a theater kid, for example. And you look to when they make their little TikToks and they're dancing around, it, it reminds one of the experience in high school that maybe we have had uh, with theater kids. And so I sort of saw it and could not unsee it. And I still think that that's a yeah, pretty accurate way to describe those kinds of people. Yeah, so you're basically describing like a government full of like SGA kids, pretty much. SGA kids? Yeah, like Student Government Association. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah no. These are the kids, they wear the, the suits to school, like the Model UN, debate bro kinds of oh, kids, yeah, and it's like, bro. People who tend to get involved in politics, I think, to make change will do it because it's the right thing to do, not because they want to LARP and dress up and wear a suit to school and get in debate, uh, debates with their teacher about, you know, nerdy policy things like that, so. Just because we want to squeeze as many more questions, unless you go to rebuttal. Oh, no, um, do I have time to make another question, or just like a small one? I want to move to as many okay. people as possible. That's okay. I'm sorry That's okay. To that to you. That's okay. Thank you so much. Okay. So when you were up, you were saying things that like describe a great leader, right? And you were talking about things like the ability for or Trump to take over the Republican Party, right? Sure. And and what would make him even better is if he was like able to step on the Democrats and pass things through. Well, despite him having both houses and like you said, control the Republican Party, he wasn't able to get things done. So then now my question is, right? when you are so willing, right, for him to use authoritarian, like, executive actions, yeah. uh, and willing to ignore things like 34 felonies and an indictment for January 6th, do you see how it could be like you're in favor of more of a Haitian president than an American president as a resident Haitian? Are you implying that uh, residents from Haiti are more likely to be criminal than American residents? Oh, well, if you look at the history of Haiti, I said Haitian president, one who acts corrupt, like a president, but is actually just an authoritarian. Right. Well, I don't know. I think that people use the word authoritarian to mean something that's like scary. Uh, George Bush, Barack Obama, any of these guys could be argued to be authoritarian. Donald Trump using constitutionally permitted actions to advance his legislative, or excuse me, his uh, legislative agenda. I don't think is necessarily like authoritarian bad guy kinds of behavior. And yeah, I do think that he's fundamentally in a better position to govern as president than he was four years ago, um, because from day one you had Paul Ryan's Congress that was acting to impede everything he did. You had John McCain, who famously withheld his vote so that Obamacare could not be repealed. You had all these remnants of the Republican establishment who would rather act in ways that they supposedly were supposed to not do, that they were professing in you know, support of, if it meant kneecapping Donald Trump's success. Now these people are absent. You look at who was not at the RNC. Paul Ryan, Mike Pence, uh, former Speaker McCarthy. These people were absent from the RNC because they understand that this is not a party that is going to house them anymore. This is a party that is becoming slowly but surely a party that can actually reflect the will of its voters. And so, yeah, I have complete confidence in Trump's ability to do that in 2024. Um, so then... I would then ask, 
would there be any, any willingness to work with the other side, or do you believe sure. it's just going to be violence? If so, how do you plan to remedy the situation? How do you plan to work with the other side if you don't believe in working with the other side? I, I don't think that uh, the issues which we support are actually issues which the other side disagrees with. For example, until Donald Trump, there were a lot of issues that were famously left-wing issues. Things like uh, being anti-war was famously a left-wing issue. Um, things like protectionism was actually more of a left-wing thing because you had Republicans who wanted total free trade because it was supposed to like lower the price of orange juice by 30 cents or something like that. Donald Trump managed to actually realign the party such that now the Republican Party is the party of not wanting to get involved in foreign conflicts, of wanting things like bringing back manufacturing to this country, to this state specifically. And so I don't think that Democrats actually are opposed to this in the way that they think they are. If you look at the issues which tend to pull higher for Democrats for this election, it's more abstract issues like apparently Republicans are so focused on issues like democracy, issues like climate change, things like that which are not frankly what people are thinking about when they're at the grocery store. And so I certainly have no intention of not working with the other side. Uh, my experience as a Republican, and I think that most Republicans can corroborate this, is that it's actually the opposite, where we are told that if we are not willing to go along with things, if we are not willing to limit ourselves to you know, staying to the left of John McCain, then we are somehow threats to democracy and we are going to end America, which Donald Trump was in office for four years. Everything was more or less fine. So I'm not worried about that. I don't think it would ever be violent. We'll jump to the next one. Wait, am I allowed to answer a product question? No. Uh, first of all, authoritarian My name is, is John, and I have button. a question for Stephen. <laughs> it's the really only question that should be asked at an event like this, and this is going to seem like a troll, but it's not. I just can't believe that it's true, so correct me if it's not, that you sat in a room or a corner of a room, very much like the one you're sitting in now, and just watched many other men plow the ever-living fuck out of your life. Is that true? Get it. All right, really we want to we want to keep it on task. So right. we're gonna jump to the next. Do you think gentleman. for guys like that? Do you think so, that they come before they come right. up and ask a question? Or do you think he's like edging himself until he gets it all out? <laughs> we're ready for your question. Sorry. Um, this is a question on behalf of a friend um, for both of you. Uh, in the last couple of months, there have been two assassination attempts on Trump with guns. Um, there was a school shooting recently as well. So gun violence issues seem to prop up pretty frequently. Uh, do you guys think there's a gun violence problem in this country? And if so, what policies would you like to see implemented under the administrations you favor? Uh, I absolutely think that's the case. I think that every time you see one of these instances, whether it's assassination attempts or whether they are shootings uh, at schools, mass acts of violence, you notice the FBI always has these people on their radar. And for some reason, there's a failure to execute, making sure that these people are uh, not being able to actually carry out these acts. So I think that there's something odd going on there. And I think that if you actually wanted to solve gun violence, you would have an FBI that is doing its job properly, which it could. It just simply chooses not to follow up on these things for whatever reason. And I think that you would enforce laws in inner cities where virtually all of the gun violence happens in the day-to-day -day level. I mean, you see these isolated instances where you have individuals going into public places or attempting to assassinate future presidents, and you look at that and you're like, okay, there's a gun violence problem. True, but in terms of the vast majority of it, that is happening in the inner cities uh, between largely gangs who are engaging in different types of uh, warfare amongst themselves, and I think that uh, that needs to be cracked down on if you actually wanted to reduce those numbers meaningfully. Um, any of the policies that I've seen proposed to stop these isolated lone wolf kinds of incidents uh, more or less don't address, I think, the real problem, which is that for some reason law enforcement understands these people are problems Problems, they are monitoring them, and then for whatever reason, nothing is done, and they end up going through and carrying out these acts. And so I think that that's, a, that's where that's coming from. Uh, no, but I was also curious as to what Destiny would have to say, since he's a liberal gun owner. So I thought that would be an interesting perspective. Um, I think that guns, I, I think there are issues with guns um, in, insofar as like gang violence or certain types of violence in inner cities are concerned, and I think they also expedite people who want to kill themselves. Um, I don't think that they're as big a problem as, as people make them out to be. I don't like that the Democratic Party makes it a central part of their platform. Uh, there are certain types of things that I think I'd be okay with, like possibly more expansive background checks. I think that closing private sale loopholes I think is good. Um, part of I think what Biden has already done uh, in, in terms of the private sale loophole stuff, or at least the um, I think the boyfriend gun loophole or whatever. Um, but but guns aren't they're not it's not a huge issue for me. And I think it's a big political loser when the party deals with it. It's like abortion for Republicans. I just think it's a really divisive topic. Uh, that being said, I, I, again, uh, something that was said earlier, I think is funny. When you talk about what an authoritarian is, an authoritarian is something that wants to centralize power in, in themselves, especially in the executive. There's a reason why we have three branches of government. Uh, for people that actually give a fuck about this country, I would recommend Federalist Paper number 51. It's a really good explanation, a breakdown of why we have checks and balances, why we have three different branches of government, and why you wouldn't want somebody like Donald Trump running the entire thing. 
Uh, and I think it's also strange in terms of how Republicans approach gun violence, or at least how John's laid it out, that we're simultaneously saying things like the FBI was incompetent, they were incapable of following up on anything, they couldn't seem to do their job right, but we also want to increase the power of the FBI and then give them the ability to follow up on everybody and do their job better. Um, it's always like both sides of the mouth, you, you know, like the GOP is, is, is destroying Trump at every step of the way, but Trump is also in control of the GOP and he can do whatever he wants. Uh, the swamp is destroying Donald Trump all the time, but next time he's going to hire the right people. Uh, the Democrats are, you know, opposed to him, so he can't do anything, but on these issues, they would actually be fundamentally aligned. Like, nothing actually makes sense. There's a reason why at the end of the day, there's no policies listed. There's nothing that's actually talked about in concrete terms. It's all just like fantastic delusion. We can take one more pithy question, and then we've got to go into the closing statements from our speakers. Yep. Uh, this question's uh, solely for Mr. Doyle. Uh, uh, sorry, this is not a very topical question. Good evening, Mr. Doyle. Someone recently, RFK Jr., who has been very vocal about the problems with American health, has thrown his weight behind Trump and may end up getting a cabinet position. How else do you believe that Donald Trump can benefit the health of Americans, especially young Americans like myself? Um, I think that a lot of what RFK is very positive. I think that the two biggest issues that we're going to face are immigration and health, because both of those are controlling for who is in the country and the quality of the people. I mean, I think that fundamentally, uh, body, soul, and mind are very intertwined. And I don't want to cast stones here, but there's a reason that you look at the people who are the most fanatically left wing, the Antifa mugshots. They sort of have a look about them. I think there's a reason for that. They're hormonally maladjusted. It's for a lot of different reasons. I mean, male testosterone is obviously decreasing. You've got pesticides, you've got fertilizers, poisons in our clothing, which is why you need to go to Undertack and buy their underwear, by the way. It's the best stuff ever. They don't use that stuff. Um, but you can ban the use of those things, which would make people less sick. And if you have people that are less sick, they're going to be just better adjusted in general. And I think that you will see those effects manifest throughout society. I mean, there's a reason why you look at you know, old footage of Americans in the 70s, 80s, or whatever. They look happier. They don't look so dreary. Now you have people who are drugged up on prescription medication. They can't get through the day without taking uh, their, their, I don't know, Adderall or Xanax or whatever these people are into. The country is sick. Everyone seems to understand that it's going in the wrong direction. But no one, except for RFK, and thank God, Trump, for bringing him on board, are actually addressing that issue, the health of Americans. You had Michelle Obama, who got in, and she was like, OK, we're going to ban fat kids no more Mountain Dew. And it's like, well, that obviously didn't do anything. So there has to be a fundamental conversation about what we are putting into the food, how it's packaged, how it's processed. And only RFK has been willing to meaningfully address that. So God bless him for that. Rebuttal. OK. Excellent. Thank you very much. We want to go into the closing statement. So we are not done yet, folks. We're going to kick it over to John for his closing statement. These are only three minutes. John, thank you very much. The floor is all yours for your closing. Yeah, I would just say that, uh, you know, the president as the executive is presiding over the sort of archipelago of bureaucracies. When we talk about the deep state or the swamp, these are very romantic terms. What that means is all of the thousands of unelected bureaucrats who do not leave their position depending upon who is in charge of being uh, you know, the enforcer of those laws. Under Trump, he's not as able to command them. Under Biden, under Kamala, they're easily, uh, more easily able to mobilize these people because they are more in alignment with how the establishment functions. And so a Trump FBI is going to function different, uh, differently in 2016 than an Obama, or excuse me, a, a Biden FBI functions in 2020 simply because the bureaucrats who are occupying those positions who are appointed by certain presidents, they understand how the game is played. And so when Trump is talking about Schedule F, constitutional, firing those bureaucrats and bringing in loyalists so that he can have a mechanically functional administration like every other president has before him, that is something that is good and that is something that will have better results for him in his second administration. So yes, it is different. That is precisely why. Um, in terms of policy success, again, I'm less interested in policy than I am in what is actually going on in the country. Republican like 101 is we want less government. We don't want to pass policy. We want government to get out of the way. That is something that can happen under a Trump administration. So I don't think that passing policy necessarily is what measures a successful presidential administration so much as how happy and how uh, provided for the people are by the incumbent administration. And again, every election is a referendum on that incumbent administration. People right now are not very happy with Joe Biden, not very happy with Kamala Harris. And I think that you're seeing Trump's uh, unpopularity go down. People are expressing more sentiment positively for him. Because of that, they're understanding that TDS is not necessarily a death sentence and that they can eventually support Donald Trump, which is sort of what's happening. And so, yeah, you notice as we continued our discussion this evening, a lot of it was about Republican conspiracy theories, uh, you know, delusions, et cetera, et cetera. It hasn't been accounted for why under the Biden administration so many of these horrible things have been happening. It's been about what Trump did, what Trump may do, what he may not do, but there's simply no answer for what has gone on under the Biden administration, which if you support Kamala Harris, you are voting for an extension of that. You are looking at what happened under Donald Trump and you are looking at what happened under Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, and you are saying a continuation of this is a closer approximation of what I want 
want the world to look like than a continuation of what Donald Trump was able to do. And I think that that is just simply delusional, um, and I don't support that at all, and I don't understand how you can be an American patriot and support that. American patriots are down bad. We are less wealthy, we are in a more dangerous situation, we are talking about mass amnesty, we are talking about billions and billions of dollars to all these other countries. We have problems here. We can solve those problems, but you simply need somebody who is willing to do it. Donald Trump has been the only political figure in any of our lifetime who has been willing to actually challenge those orthodoxies, and he's done so successfully to a certain extent, and I look forward to seeing how he's able to complete the job in a second administration, given that he will have loyalists staffing his administration, which do exist, and which are going to make big, beautiful things happen. So I think we should all support Donald Trump. Thank you very much for that closing. We'll kick it over to Stephen for his closing as well. Stephen, the floor is yours for three minutes. You ever feel like your head is spinning after listening to a conservative talk? Sometimes it's good to just take a deep breath, take a step back, and do a reality check. Why would somebody say people are hormonally maladjusted under all sorts of drugs when they're a conservative? Go onto Tinder, walk out on the streets, go to any large blue city, and then go to any rural area. When you go to the rural areas, what do you see? A whole bunch of fat fucks on insulin because they're obese and they have type two diabetes. If you wanna talk about people that are unhealthy, that are on drugs, that are reliant on big pharma to survive, it's conservatives. The idea that somehow it's, you know, some college girl who, you know, cut her wrist and now she's on a little bit of Xanax is destroying the country, uh, but not uh, these people that are getting older, that are fatter, that are destroying our entire economy because of how much it costs to keep them alive for every single year. Another toe falls off, uh, you know, another increase of their prescription happens for whatever more insulin medication they need. It's just the idea that a conservative would attack our, our, our medications and say that this is somehow the fault of liberals when conservative old people are some of the largest consumers of everything in the country. There's a reason why there's a net transfer from the successful blue states, okay, that are powered by blue industry uh, over to the less successful red states uh, that are powered by God knows what these days. Uh, it's just delusion. Uh, I think that the, the entire conservative apparatus, honestly, I think John said it really well earlier when he said, we're not happy about things right now, therefore Trump. I think that a lot of the Republican support for Trump right now just comes from a lack of understanding about anything. So for instance, when Doyle says, uh, you know, all these people are allowed to appoint people, but they can't get rid of people when they come in as a new uh, administrator. That's not true. If you appoint somebody, you can uh, fire that person. That's part of the appointment power of the president. These bureaucrats, the reason why they stay there is because every time you swap the government, you're not going to hire and fire, you know, 10,000, 100,000, however many people you need to restaff the entire executive branch of the government. It's delusional. The main reason why people don't like the bureaucrats on the Trump side is because these people do have an institutional bias, and that bias is towards the existence of and the perseverance of the United States. Just look at Donald Trump trying to circumvent the results of the last election. Who were the people that stood in front of him? It was largely bureaucrats. It was people like Pat Cifalone, or it was people in the DOJ like uh, like Rosen or like Donahue, or it was White House lawyers uh, like Eric Hirschman and Steve Engel. Uh, it, it was the bureaucrats. It was the people that had the institutional knowledge, that had the appreciation for the United States. As, jo as uh, Doyle said, they don't get paid a ton of money. And they're generally just there because they appreciate the country. Even when you look at people like William Barr, who historically was known for wanting to see the executive branch expanded in power the, the, with the president specifically, Barr quit because he was so disgusted at Donald Trump trying to weaponize his department with just a couple weeks to go before the election or not even before the election. I'm sorry, before the certification of the vote. So when, when you hear conservatives say things like, I don't like bureaucrats, I don't like the way the government's working, all of that is a smokescreen for, I want Donald Trump to be an authoritarian dictator. That's it. Even when they say things like, we just want government to get out of the way. That's not true. What did we hear all the arguments made for in favor of tonight? We like the fact that government is going to ban trans stuff. We like the fact that the government is going to ban seconds. abortion. We like the fact that they're going to crack down harder on BLM riots, that the FBI is going to expand their power, they're going to go after people that might be school shooters, and we're going to get pesticides and additives out of food, and we're going to do all these things to prosecute political this is all expansions of power of government republicans stand for nothing time. i hate donald trump <laughs> thank you very much i'm going to i'm going to keep it very pithy and then i'm going to give it over to sean for his final thank yous but i want to say thank you very much folks it's been a true pleasure to be with you tonight and if you're watching live hit that subscribe button for more i'm going to hand it over to sean thank you very much sean Thank you so much, James. Everybody give him a big round of applause. I just want to thank first both John and Destiny 
for participating in this debate. And I'd like to thank everybody who paid to come here to help support this event. Like I said, we're dealing with a lawsuit right now, which is very complicated business, very expensive. So having that support really means a lot because you're actually fighting for free speech. You're actually putting your money on the line to help us. So we really appreciate it. If you're a backstage ticket holder or royalty ticket holder and you did not get your shirt that's included yet, just talk to us in the back and we can get it for you. And if you're a royalty member or ticket holder and you are coming to the dinner tonight, and you need the location, just come up to me or one of my guys in the Uncensored America shirts and they can tell you the location. It'll be immediately after uh, this event. And if you're here for the meet and greet too, which is for backstage and royalty, uh, we'll make a line right here for everybody. Also, if you're in South Carolina or nearby, we're gonna be hosting a debate between Destiny and Infowars Owen Schroyer on this very topic, Trump Kamala, uh, versus Kamala Harris. So if you wanna see that debate, in person, you can come uh, to University of South Carolina on October 14th. Get tickets at uncensoredamerica.us. If you want to watch it and can't make it, you can go to uncensoredamerica.us as well to watch the live stream. And there's all a bunch of uh, videos, merch, everything else you can check out on there. So please check that out and please follow uh, John at Comrade Doyle on X and Destiny at the Omni Liberal on X as well. And you can check them out on their websites as well heckoffcommy.com and dg, destiny.dgg. Thank you everybody for coming out. Have a great night.